for your attention. I think as we're going to try and keep to time as far as possible, we will begin. Okay. Right, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam Salamaka and I am the director of the National Network for Translation. And I would like to welcome you today on behalf of the network, but also on behalf of the, our sister network, the National Network for Interpreting. With, uh, within the framework of the HEFSI-funded Roots into Languages program, the two networks are involved in promoting the careers of translation and interpreting through organizing career events, developing online resources, and working on also on the development of graduate placement schemes at the national and regional, i.e. European uh, level. Today's event is organized jointly by the University of Westminster and the Institute for Translation and Interpreting with support from Capital L, London Consortium, and the National Networks for Translation and Interpreting. The Swati model is a well-established practice and it is also a very good example of collaboration between academic institutions, the ITI, and other stakeholders. Today's speakers will share with you their experience of how to get into the profession, how to develop as successful, competent, engaged translators and interpreters, but also, and last but not least, how to promote yourself, the status of, of your profession. I think that's a very important part as well of, of these uh, events. So without further ado, I will uh, welcome my colleague, Jane Jones, who will say a few more things about the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, right, as you see, my name is Jane Jones. I'm a freelance translator, a long-standing member of the ITI, and a lecturer in translation at Westminster. So I cover all three bases. Um, uh, just a couple of sort of practical questions. Um, toilets, always uppermost in people's minds. Ladies, on the stairs where you came in, and also on the ground floor by the lifts, and for the men, by the lifts on the ground floor. Um, at refreshment times, the refreshments will be served in the hall where you registered this morning. At lunchtime, um, it's a nice day out there, so you'll probably want to go out, but if anyone has brought their own food, you can eat it in the hall. Um, for sandwiches, whatever, I would turn right, turn right again onto Regent Street, and there are plenty of places to sell you food. Um, right, without further ado, I think we will carry on to the first speaker, which is Sarah Griffin Mason, um, who's going to talk to you about various aspects of translation and where you can do it. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, like Jane, I'm, I'm a, also a freelance translator and a lecturer in translation studies since March last year, and I'm a member of the ITI. Um, I'm Sarah Griffin Mason. I started my career as an in-house translator and later went on to freelance. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about sort of you know, the advantages and disadvantages, what you can get from either s format of work, um, some of the dangers perhaps, and I'm going to talk a bit about being a generalist or being a specialist and how this can sort of help you to develop your career. I did this talk last year, since then I haven't looked at it, so hopefully I'll <laughs> remember what it's about as we go along. I've put in pretty pictures to remind me. So. And Jane, tell me when to... Yes. Okay. Right. When I started out, I thought translation had a career path. I thought it was you do this, then you do that, then you do that. I thought it was some kind of a, like a labyrinth where there was one path, you followed it, you'd get to the end. Well, over the years, experience has taught me it is not like that at all. It, it's, it's more of a maze with dead ends, with bits that come in from here, there, and everywhere. All the translators I know, the most experienced, the most professional, the most high-earning, have come in through different paths. 
there isn't a one-size-fits-all, you do this, you plan it, you will be a, a wonderful translator at the end of it and you'll stay in translation forever. Okay? It tends to be the sort of profession that builds up with all sorts of things coming in from all sorts of directions and you tend to mature into your best productivity and earning capacity quite late. Okay? It is a, a, a profession for people with other life experience going on too. Okay, so it's not straightforward. Um, before we start, okay, obviously the people in this room all want to be a translator or an interpreter. Okay, they, they, you've all obviously got a good background in languages or you wouldn't be here. And the good news is that there will always be a need for human translators and interpreters. Machines just can't do language. Okay? Language is an exceptionally human thing and machines just cannot cope with it. Certain types of controlled languages they can deal with. Certain types of, of, of common structures can be dealt with, but you always are going to need people. Okay? The Star Trek Universal Translator has not been invented and nor, as far as I can see, will it ever be. Okay? They've been talking about machine translation since the 60s and it's moved on, it's improved, but it's still a long, long way from what human beings can do. So don't worry, there are jobs, okay? Right, you've probably already thought about what qualities, skills, and knowledge you need before going into translation and interpreting. There are the obvious ones. I, you, you obviously need very, very deep knowledge of two languages at least, possibly more. Um, you also should be absolutely brilliant at handling the language you're translating into. You should be aware of lots of different genres, lots of different requirements. And, you know, if you're planning on making good money at translation, you also need to know about a subject. That, that's where the money is, basically. Okay? So, what you can offer in translation and what it can offer you. So you need this deep bilingual understanding of two languages. I do know translators who can't speak their source language extremely well, but they can read it at a very high level in specialist fields, okay? And I know people, environmentalists, for example, who know their subject so well that they can read it in other languages that they're not expert at, but because they're an expert in the subject, they understand the concepts so they can transfer it across. But whenever you get into things like cultural texts or texts where you need to know the background and the wider, um, have a wider understanding of culture, you do need that deep understanding. Okay? It's only in very, very specialist fields you can do without it. What you're selling your clients is your writing in your native language. What they're paying you for is absolutely clear and brilliant text in the language you're translating into. So as well as polishing up your source languages, you need to be concentrating on your writing style. Okay? If you have trouble with punctuation, you'll hand one job in, people go, can't even punctuate out. Okay, so you've got to really concentrate on your, your target language. That's what they're paying you for. Translation's a really weird field where quite often the people who are buying your services can't judge the quality of what they're getting because they don't know what's in the source text, which is why they're paying you to translate it. Okay, so they've got only your word to say whether your translation is good or not. Or, no, they'll check it. Obviously, there are procedures in place. But it's, it's very often the case that your client doesn't know. So you've got to be able to argue your case and convince them that what you've done is right. Okay? And obviously, this is the biggie, subject knowledge someone will pay you to translate. Okay? My background was all in non-governmental organizations and journalism, which was lovely when I had a paid job in it. When it came to competing on the market, there were hundreds of people who could do what I could do, and they would do it cheaper. So you need to have a subject that people will pay for. So on my first year after I, I did an MA at Portsmouth in 2005, I went to the Association of Translation Companies meeting in London, and there was a, a chap speaking there who'd surveyed which subject areas are most translated. Okay? And unsurprisingly, finance, medical, legal, multilateral organizations, and the other one that I always forget, technology maybe. Okay? So, they're the ones people are going to pay for. They're not only paying for your language, they're paying for your knowledge of the subject. So if you've got anything that you're an expert on, build that up as part of your portfolio. Okay? I know people who do yachting catalogues. That is what they do day in, day out, and they make a living translating those because they know about yachts. They know what each little metal thing and bit of rope and everything is called. Okay? So they do that day in, day out. 
Okay? It's amazing what you can specialize in that will give you money. I know people who translate websites, they're, they're, they're into vintage motorbikes, they translate websites for vintage motorbike clubs in various countries because they know all about it. Okay? It's amazing what, what comes up. Okay? The great thing about translation, and this is probably why most of people stick at it for so long, is that you can make a good living at it if you manage yourself as a business and you manage yourself well. It gives you immense flexibility. Um, all of my work comes via email. It all goes back via email. All the work I do is in various places on the internet generally, and I can do that wherever. My clients don't even need to know where I am because you know, as long as you've got access to the internet, you can work anywhere. Our profession, you're not allowed to say this anymore, is pre predominantly women. Women do tend to do the bulk of childcare. Women do tend to bear babies. And it's a, a profession that fits quite nicely around that. You know, a lot of people will go through a period where they will work from home, they will work in school hours, because that's the only time they've got free, and it's, it's wonderful for that. Okay? It does give you independence and freedom. If you're willing to take the challenge, you can get a vast variety of texts come through to you. And depending on how confident you feel and you know, how threatened you might feel by the content, it's up to you whether you do the job or not. And um, it's up to your professional judgment whether you can or cannot do it. And I know early on it's sometimes tempting to go, yeah, I, I can, you know. <coughs> Antibiotics for pigs in Chile. Yeah, I can do that. I can do that, yeah. And then you start and you go, mm, actually not. So it's a really good idea if you feel out of your depth and you're sure you can't, just say, I'm sorry, this isn't my area of specialism. Okay, it's all right to do that. And in fact, the people you're dealing with will value you for that. Okay? If you say you can do it and you hand in something that's rubbish, they're not going to come back to you. Okay? Um, someone once said to me, you're only as good as your last job. And I was like, oh, that's a tough call all the time. But with that client you are, but you don't need to go broadcasting that you actually made a mess up with that person. You, know, you just go to someone else. But it's a good idea to try to hand in a professional job every time. And then, of course, things will come up where you will get stimulation, excitement, and travel, depending on what your field is. But a lot of people I know spend a lot of time you know, going to see their clients, visiting their clients. Um, interpreters, well, they, Kirsty Morgan, she, she keeps a, a line-up of um, suitcases in her hallway so that she's always ready to fly off to wherever the next job comes in for. So if you want that sort of lifestyle, that's possible. Okay. My story. Okay. I haven't studied language until I did my MA. I lived in Brussels as a child because it was the EU was starting, every company in the world had a, an office in Brussels at the time and my dad worked for a big company. And I was seven when I went, I was monolingual, but everybody in the school spoke at least two languages. Most spoke three or more. And you just assumed people spoke more than one language. And so we learnt French from the kids we played with in the street, we learnt a little bit of Flemish because we were in a French speaking area, and then we learnt German. So it just was natural. And because I was a lazy child and languages came easily to me, I kept the languages up and I got an A-level in French. And I got myself a place at university to, to do modern foreign languages. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to take a year out. I'm going to travel a bit and think. And on my year out, I thought, what can I do with languages? And I thought, oh, I can be a language teacher. And I thought, hmm. I used to look at Mrs. Smythe, my French teacher, suffering at the front of the classroom, trying to bash verbs into people's heads. And I thought, I don't want to do that. I really don't want to do it. So um, I went to university and did a degree in archaeology, <laughs> <laughs> which was lovely, yeah, really nice. And then I finished that, and I thought, what do I do now? Oh, I really ought to grow up, you know, get sensible, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, I know what. At that time, the funded PGC, I'll go and do that, I'll be a teacher, and then I'll decide what to do. So that's what I did. And I taught for a few years in, in London, mainly, and then in, in East Ham, and then moved to Dorset, Blandford Forum. And all of this, it seems massively irrelevant, and it is. But success stories aren't, this is where I start, that's where I end. They go like this. Okay? And on the way, you pick up stuff. And some of it's useful, and some of it isn't. But in translation, oddly, just about all of it will be at some point. Okay? In the process, I did a lot of teaching of children with second languages. I did a lot of teaching of children with no English. I, I learned an awful lot about language learning, language processing. Um, it, I, I just picked up loads of information about how education systems works. 
work. One of my best clients now is a European entity that deals with education in the European partner countries, and I get paid really nice money for editing stuff about education written by non-native speakers. So it all adds to the mix. Okay, so don't think what you're doing is irrelevant. It may well not be in the long run. Then I came back to languages. The, my university boyfriend was an ecologist, an environmentalist, and he worked for the Ecologist magazine. And at the time, there was an Earth Summit going to be held in Rio de Janeiro. And he got a job as an editor in an office in Montevideo, Uruguay, editing things written by non-natives and making them presentable for this massive international audience that were going to be in Rio. And in their wisdom, the people in the office said, you're a teacher, you could correct English. And I'm like, well, I probably could, yeah. Didn't mention that I was te teaching five-year-olds and they couldn't write English. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so off I went for six months and did that. And one job led to another. And this is another thing. In Uruguay, I was a rare thing. I was an educated English speaker and writer, educated to degree level. I could write okay, not brilliantly, but I could write okay. And that gave me the edge on most of the other translators there. There weren't native English speakers. So work came to me and I thought, this is fantastic. You know, I just stand here and work comes to me. And I ended up getting a job as an editor and corrector that went on and on and kept being renewed. And um, I loved the place. I'd, I'd done a basic course in Spanish before I went, but I spoke French as a child, so basically, oops, same language as far as I was concerned. It was pretty, pretty similar. And um, so I learned Spanish because I was working in an office where a lot of the people had been former exiles. They weren't keen on Europe. They weren't keen on los Yankees y los gringos, and I was one of those. So um, I had to learn Spanish because they wouldn't speak to me. Okay, so I learned. And then because it, Uruguay is a really nice, exceptionally sort of stable little country in a rather unstable continent. And so lots of big international agencies have offices there, so translation work came. And it was lovely stuff. It was about women, it was about social issues, it was about you know, a little bit of politics and economics, which didn't quite make it for me, but you know, loads of things came up. I got to go to the COP4 conference in Buenos Aires and translate all the conference newspapers and things like that. It was lovely stuff. And then I got a, work at, a job at the Interpress service, which is a, a press agency, and the Montevideo office translates things written by correspondents from across Latin America and sometimes from mainland Spain. So that's what I did all day, eight hours a day, hammering away at a keyboard. Okay. That trained me as a translator and editor, which isn't quite the same as a translator because I had a lot of freedom to fiddle with the texts. And I learned an awful lot about translation just by doing it and because I worked with translators working into Spanish and into English. And I worked there for years, and we whacked out 4,000 words a day because we were expected to, and we didn't know that that was rather a lot. Okay? And then I got married, and I started a family. All lovely. Okay? But then Argentina hit the skids. Okay? The, the economy started nosediving. My private clients started to dry up. I was working part-time. I had a small baby, and I thought... Mm, this is a bit scary. So I thought, I know what, I'll go back to England. I'm such a brilliant translator that I'll just walk into England and they'll all sit, throw jobs at me. Okay, so I, I came back, launched a freelance career, and got no work. Because obviously in England there are lots of people who can do Spanish. So I sort of tried to find out why I was getting no work, and basically people here were much better qualified. And I didn't even have a languages degree. And people were saying, you've got lovely experience, but we can't employ you. We can't insure you. You've got no, no, no qualification. So I did a, an MA in translation studies in Portsmouth because I was in Portsmouth and they happened to do one part time. And I had, to, I had a family to run, so I did that. I joined the Institute of Translation and Interpreting, which was the best move I made, quite honestly, because it's the only place you're going to find a massive group of successful translators who make a living from it and do it day in, day out. And I've been freelancing here. That says nine years. That's wrong. It must be ten now. Okay. <laughs> That's from last year. Okay. So, I've had a background in-house. I've had a background freelancing. In-house, what you get, if you can get an in-house position, which are increasingly rare these days, is that you will get a really good knowledge of an area, a specialism. Okay? I know people who've worked as as medical secretaries, and from that they've gone on to do medical translation because they understand the systems, they understand 
all the job rankings, they understand the areas of medicine, they've got that insider knowledge, so they've got an advantage to start with. Um, other people I know have come to translation after they had a career in the automotive industry or the pharmaceutical industry or whatever, so they already know the whole world of knowledge before the language issue comes in. Okay? Another advantage of in-house is that you can network. If the people in your office know, oh, so-and-so, she can translate, okay, your name gets passed on, you do a good job for someone, you help someone, you advise them on where to find a translator even, your name becomes, you're the expert on that. Okay? And networks, word of mouth is the best way to get clients. Personal contact and word of mouth is the absolute, you can't beat it. What you will get if you're in a team where there's more than one translator is you'll get feedback on your work. And mm, I say in a supportive environment, mostly in a supportive environment. You will get people who criticize you, especially people who say they're bilingual. And they'll say, no, you don't do that. Because they've you know, got their background and they've been the expert and they may question what you're doing. I, I worked with a, an American girl and myself and we had constant arguments about what was correct. But we realized that there were you know, some differences we just had to accept. And supportive environment, mostly supportive. Like I say, I was in Uruguay, I was a northerner, I was being paid you know, the same rate as people who'd worked their whole life there. You know, it, it, there were issues, but after a while, you know, respect grew and you know, people were supportive. I worked on a desk of editors. When I first started, I was there facing the wall. They were on a big communal table where they'd all argue about points of politics and stuff very loudly and smoke you know, <laughs> tons. And I was against the wall over there. And by the time I left, me and the other translators were all on the big table too. So it, you know, it, it takes time, but it works. Okay? And we had a, a give and take relationship. All of my work was corrected by an editor who had no Spanish. So he wasn't correcting my translation, but he was correcting my English, my journalistic English, which was great. Yeah, great, but sometimes we did argue. So if you can get an in-house job, you learn and you get paid at the same time. Okay? And the pay wasn't brilliant, but the experience was worth it. Okay. Cons of in-house. A lot of people, a lot of my students go and get project man management jobs. They, they're, they're flogged to death to meet deadlines, da, 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 and then they're stuck in project management because they still don't have the translation experience. Okay? Beware of that. It's a really good thing to do to work in a translation company or agency to learn about how the system works, etc. Okay, it's a really valuable experience. But if you want to be a translator, don't get stuck in that. Um, in house, yeah, we were doing four thousand words a day. We were being paid a thousand dollars a month, which in Uruguay was good money. It's a pittance, and and quite often in house jobs will be paid at low rates overall, okay? but it's a great way to get trained. And your training might not be as good as you expected. Okay? And also you have to deal with all the politics, right? which um, can be complicated, especially when it's in another language. A friend of mine who worked in Hong Kong, when she left her job after six months, she was given two parties, leaving parties, and she was like, why? And apparently there'd been a war going on in the office which she had been totally unaware of for the whole six months. Yeah, so she was lucky, but sometimes you are in the middle of a war and you've got to be, deal with it. Freelancing. Okay, lovely. You're your own boss. You work when you want to, who you, with who you want to, when you want to. You set your own rates, which sounds marvellous, but there is a market out there and you are in competition, so you've got to be realistic. Okay? And, you, yeah, you can be there like St. Jerome in your lovely room with the sunlight and your lion and your whatever that is. You know, lovely. But... Um, you are on your own, and it can be a very isolating experience. If you don't get up and work, you don't get paid. I was my own boss for, you know, I, I started working half-time at the university last year, and I was my own boss in the meantime, and I was a bitch. I never gave myself holidays. I never gave myself time off. You know, it was, I've got to work because I've got to pay the bill, and I've got to pay the mortgage, you know, and you've got to do that for yourself. You're, you're the one there flogging yourself, okay? So it's up to you to keep yourself going. And you have to find your clients. And that can be very difficult. Okay, oops. And you have to get them to pay you. Right. I believe these websites will be, these, these um, will they be on the? I'm, I'm not the one to ask. 
Okay. Is it still? This is the old website, but it's easy to use the internet. Okay. Because there's a lot of. Could you repeat that in case people didn't hear? Maybe it's just there. Okay. Yes, it takes you to the old website and it would take you onto the new one, yeah? Is this the new one or the old one? This is the new one. This is the new one, okay. So it's all there. Um, I presume they'll be put on the website afterwards. They normally are. Okay. Right, so, yes, the, the ITI, the IOL, pros.com is interesting to look at. It's a good place to start. You can get a lot of idea of what's going on from places like that. And online journals and websites can be very useful. Okay. Just wait till the clicking stops of people taking pictures. <laughs> okay, but this, this will be made available to you afterwards. Okay. You need to have real world experience. Okay, so if you can't get a translation job, get a job using your languages in a field and learn about that field. And these are some of the recruiters who are at the language show in London. If you can get to the language show, it's wonderful. They, there are always a few people recruiting. Okay, there are places to get jobs. Like I said, this will be made available to you afterwards. Okay? Ah, yes. Not all five year plans are great. Okay? <laughs> Some have their limitations, but in our course, in our MA at Portsmouth, we get our students who do the professional, um, professional aspects of translation course to do a five-year plan. And in all probability, they won't be where they thought they would be in five years' time, but they will have made a plan and they will have moved on. If you don't make plans, you don't move on. So make a five-year plan. doesn't matter if you throw it out after two months and start again. It's... Thinking it out, where am I going? What do I want to be in five years' time? Where do I want to be in five years' time? And you'll find that things pop up along the way, not always what you expect, but you'll keep moving forward. Right. Well, thanks. thanks, Sarah, very much. Um, you've probably noticed that at the end of the morning session, we do have um, a panel question and answer session. So our speakers will be there and, and you'll be able to ask your questions then. Um, have we got Rose with us? Yes, good. Right, now you're going to hear something about interpreting from Rose Campbell. Can you show hi, me Rose. how? Yeah, hi. Yes. Thank you. Got it. How do I move forwards? That one? Space bar. Okay. Okay. Right, good morning everybody. Um, my name is Rose Campbell. I'm a freelance public service interpreter, among other things. I also am a translator and I also teach here at the University of Westminster where I myself studied uh, many years ago. So I think in today's world, often if you're a linguist, you tend to do more than just one job. And indeed, just in public service interpreting, as I hope to explain to you, there are an awful lot of different jobs that people do. Um, so public service interpreting is broadly split into two different sectors. There's the health sector, and you see this cheery chap in the middle with his stethoscope, and then there's legal work. And this will, in this case, I've just given you a picture of the courts. These are the three magistrates, probably lay magistrates, and the familiar Bobby on the beat that we all love to love in this country. So, what do I do? Go on to that. So, where do public service interpreters work? Well, it's a huge, broad range of different places, and often you never go back to the same place again. As you can see in the top left, you've got the Crown Court. But that's only just one of the many courts we've got in this country where PSI um, people work. You've got the best of all courts, which is very exciting to work at, the Old Bailey, the criminal, central criminal court in London. Then you've got all the magistrates courts. Um, you've got youth courts, family courts, and courts I've never been to at all. The appeal court um, I have never been to, which I think is just by Parliament, and a coroner's court, which could be rather a distressing experience I guess but again I've never been there and I've been doing this job for getting on for 18 years now so there's a huge range of places you might find yourselves working. In the middle you've got the Asylum and Immigration Tribunal, 
Uh, they can also, you can go to, I go to social security tribunals where it is decided on appeal whether someone has um, had their benefits justifiably or whether they should be cut. Uh, there are employment tribunals as well. So again, that's a vast range of different places. And um, top right, you've got the Metropolitan Police, that familiar little um, old sort of light fixture, I guess, that's outside of many police stations. But London has two police forces. There's the Metropolitan Police, which deals with most of London. And then there's the City of London Police, which is slightly different in a separate body. And then you've got 41 other constabularies around the country all of which need interpreters from time to time. What they tend to do is kick off um, discussing things with a victim or a witness or a suspect by using a body called language line, whereby the person in the police station is, is shown a, a great table with different languages in it saying, if this is your language, point to this or something like that. And the person will point to the language. And on the basis of that, they will then call an interpreter and you'll have the first, the initial conversation by language line on the telephone. And then depending on how the police want to take the matter forward, they will then call an interpreter to come in and help deal with the case. Then on the bottom left, you've got hospital. This is my local hospital, guys. But equally, you have many other different hospitals. You've got all the doctors' surgeries around London and the country. Um, I often work in Moorfields Eye Hospital, so a little bit more specialised. A lot of work uh, for public service interpreters in Great Ormond Street Hospital as well, which has a very international flavour to its patients, people coming in from abroad to have treatment for their children. And finally, bottom right, you've got the classic HM Prison. And these are dotted all around the country. Uh, sometimes they're in very hard to get to places and you have to really work out quite carefully if you're going to get there on time because they are, by definition, a lot of them put in places where were someone to escape, they would find it a little bit more difficult to find their way, uh, to, well, to, to get away. <coughs> so this just gives you a, a very brief feel of how many different places you might find yourself working in. This is a very out and about sort of a job. It's not somewhere, um, it's not something you do, maybe translators a little bit more at home working in their own environment. As you saw from the picture, you can wear your dressing gown and your slippers and you don't have to get up. Um, if you're interpreting, obviously you've got to get up and get to the place and that's often the first challenge. And it's not always a place that people are familiar maybe uh, working or very comfortable working in. Because you don't often, who goes to a prison, you know, it's very, I always feel slightly privileged to go to prisons in that most people in the public aren't allowed into prisons and so it's a sort of special. However, when my daughter was much younger and she boldly announced into school one day, she said, my mummy's gone to prison today. <laughs> I could see the teacher's sort of eyebrows shooting up thinking, oh yes. So I spend a lot of my time looking at train timetables, looking at maps, walking into things as I get my phone and try to work out if I should be going left or right down the road. But it's all very uh, challenging and amusing. So who needs our services? Well, you've got the Her Majesty's Court Service, you've got judges, magistrates, defendants, uh, witnesses, uh, obviously you've got barristers, solicitors, probation officers, and then all the staff who work at a court, the, the ushers, the clerk, the court staff, maybe your client's going to have to pay a fine and needs to have explained to him or her how that all happens. And of course the jury, if it's a big jury trial, the jury also need to understand what you're saying. So there's a big range of people there too who need you. In a police or a situation, you've got the officers. Now is it a police constable or is it a police detective? Is he plain clothes? Is he an inspector? P police are quite keen on, on their ranks. It's quite important, if you can, to recognise what they are and call them by their, by their proper rank. Equally, you have, um, you have the suspect, maybe. You might have a witness. You might have the witness's family who come along as well. So again, a big range of people. And the victim of some crime, they will come along to the police as well. It's not just finding a suspect. Uh, it's also the other side of policing, which is helping people who are victims of crime. And then the hospital surgery environment, you have the doctors, the patients, the nurses, the assistants, the clerical staff, and all the family members. And they are all in some way or other hoping that you will help them in some way. They all need you, and they all need to have confidence in you and how you work. 
The types of interpreting um, public service interpreters do, you probably will know all this, but I'll just run through it briefly anyway. So consecutive is like a game of ping pong. One person says something in one language, you say it back in the other language, and then the, that person replies, and then you go back to the other first person saying what they've said back into the first language. And it goes on like that, fairly short pieces of information, and you keep it all fairly dynamic so everyone is, is involved. For that, you just really need pen, paper, and possibly a bottle of water. Then we do what's called simultaneous interpreting, which is uh, when it's without headphones and not in a booth, we call chuchotage, which is basically whispering to the person what's happening. And this takes place a lot in a situation in court where things are carrying on around you. Oh, I'm sorry. No one will wait for you, and you just have to carry on talking over them and follow what's happening. And that can be quite challenging. You can see the bottom right, the picture of the girl, um, the very elegant interpreter there talking to her client, who looks rather impassive, it has to be said. Now, if you look at her, she's in an incredibly twisted position, and I suspect she wouldn't be able to hold that for too long without getting bad back pains and needing a physio afterwards. I once did a six-week trial, it's the only time I've done such a long trial, where I had to chuchotage into somebody's ear for six weeks, every day, ten till four. And I, it really was quite hard on the neck after a few weeks because you were constantly in this same slightly cricked position. And being the sort of case it was, the judge was very keen that we all sat in the same places every day. So there was no chance of doing a Monday, Tuesday, a Wednesday, Friday, I'll sit on your left, and Tuesday, Thursday, I'll sit on your right. No, no. Had to be the same place every day. So it has its challenges with it. Uh, the next type of interpreting you might be asked to do is sight translations. Uh, in a doctor situation, this could be a medical report that comes with someone. Legally, this could be a, some document, some uh, anything. I mean, it, it could be letter, um, any documents that accompany a person, information that's come from abroad about a person. You might be asked to sight translate that on the spot. Uh, equally with a medical situation, there might be leaflets, how to deal with post-operative care, how to prevent something happening again, and these are all things you might on the spot have to be asked to interpret for your client. Then we've got written translations. These again might be documents, um, health reports from a doctor that have come from abroad, and something fairly recent for me that I've only started doing in the last six months is prison letters. Prison letters are very interesting because you have rather a strange window into someone else's life. I know all prisoners know that their letters are selectively in, uh, translated in order to ensure that they're not saying, get me out of here, you know, bring a helicopter, and they never are. And they're always rather sweet letters, or not always, but they're generally rather sweet letters about, you know, darling, I miss you so much, and it's really awful here, and the food is appalling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I had been doing some of these translations for a few months, and I'd done three or four of the same person, and I. You, know, you have this strange window into someone else's life, and you're thinking, that's very odd. And then I went to a case shortly before Christmas where it was several people, and it was Mr. Rossi et al., so and lots of other people. And there it turned out, and there was someone with the same surname, and I thought, gosh, that's a strange coincidence. And of course, blow me down, it was the person. It was the same person, and I had translated all his letters to his wife for the last three months. Now, of course, it was, I, it was a surreal situation, and I thought, blimey, this, then I've, I couldn't say anything. I just had to keep very quiet and not say, oh, I know all about your granddaughter, Stefania, and like, <laughs> how's, how's, how's Chiara getting on at school or something? But it was just, you have to, you find yourself in situations sometimes where you just have to be very sort of calm and, and composed and think, okay, I have, I'm privy to quite a lot of information, but I must not let this person know that. So that was an interesting experience I had recently. Video conferences happen quite a lot now because it's much cheaper than bringing someone to court. It costs hundreds of pounds to transfer someone from a prison. So if they can do it over the video, then they will do that. It's not very satisfactory in terms of you don't have the one-to-one -one with the person you're trying to work with, but it is used more and more as a um, cost-saving exercise. And then telephone interpreting. I get called from London Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, people who have dodgy ID, people who have something in their suitcase that maybe oughtn't to be there, and you're talking on the phone with the customs officer. So that's that one. The workplace. This is just one example of a courtroom, the sort of place I work uh, on a fairly frequent basis. They're not all like this. This is quite a nice one, actually, because on the right-hand side you can see the dock where the defendant will stand, and you would stand next to him or her. 
Um, however, often the dock is round at the bottom of the page where the public seating is. And so, of course, everyone is talking with their back to you and you don't have the advantage of seeing their mouth move, which when you're interpreting can be very helpful. Not least because sometimes you might be behind a thick pane of glass with or without microphones relaying what's being said. So there are certain challenges uh, in working in courtrooms, not least the acoustics. Uh, people might, <laughs> there might be distractions. The, the nice dock officer who is there in the dock with you might suddenly start making a phone call down to the cells or he might blow his nose very loudly. And lots of things can happen that can put you off your, off your um, pace slightly. But the thing to remember if you are in a situation where you're not following or you're not clear about uh, the pace of something and you're not able to keep up is to stand up and say so, frankly. I have no qualms about standing up and stopping proceedings and saying, Your Honour, I can't hear, I can't follow this, I need to have a copy of this. Because often copies of everything will be distributed very happily to all the barristers, all the solicitors if they're sitting behind, all the jury will have a copy, and the only person in the whole room who doesn't have a copy of this document which is about to be read up is you and the client. So I think there's no problem with standing up and saying, look, I need to, hear what's, I need to see what you're all reading because it's going too fast. Because you know, when people read out from a document, they tend to read very fast, much faster than if they're ad-libbing. So those are some of the challenges. Um, equally, cells, prison visits. These are often rather dingy places in the ground or the basement floor underneath the cell are the courts with strip lighting on the ceiling. And it's quite strict there. You're not allowed any bags. All you're allowed is your pen and your paper and maybe your ID around your neck. So you have to be prepared not to have any cough sweets or tissues or anything with you. They're quite strict when you go down there. There's also a thing along the wall when you're talking to someone who is um, under arrest, which is a sort of an emergency band. And I remember it was either myself or a solicitor. We'd finished a conference with a client and we leant back against the wall and this set off the most God almighty alarm and they came pounding down the corridors <laughs> thinking someone was being murdered. So I'm very wary now of this alarm strip along the wall and I'm always keeping well away from it. It's very good that it's there, however. Interpreters should never be left alone with their client. Even if someone seems to be the most reasonable person in the world, you have to remember that in a situation of being in a cell or in a prison, they are where they probably don't want to be, and you are someone who's going to be getting out at the end of the meeting with them. So, and people can behave in, irrational, in ra irrational ways, I think, when they're maybe under stress. So you should never be left alone, even for a short time, with, um, with, a, with a prisoner, certainly, with anyone who is under arrest. And even in health situations, well, normally that's all right. I mean, normally in a health surgery, I wouldn't have any qualms about being left. However, having said that, I have dealt with quite a lot of mental health patients. And there again, people are... You don't really know how people are going to react. And if it's something with a heavy mental health aspect to it, I don't think you should ever be left alone with a patient. If the, if the person goes out, I think you should go out with them. It's just for your own safety. In prisons, you have to be prepared to be frisked. Some people maybe don't like that very much. Uh, sniffer dogs will be coming up to you. Sniffer dogs love me, and they give me a lovely sniff over because I have a dog. And I'm always worried that they're going to think she's definitely got something in her, <laughs> on her, round her, over her. Um, they, they definitely like me, the big tail wagging as they w try and work out what sort of a hound I have. But you're not even allowed to take tissues into prisons because they may be impregnated with some sort of a drug. There are, people are very uh, creative in ways of bringing drugs into prison. So you have to, again, like visiting the cells under courts, just have pen, paper and maybe your ID. And beware of holes in your socks because you may have to take your shoes off when you go through the x-ray <laughs> machine. You don't want to show yourself up. In the hospital environment, uh, I'm sure you've all been to doctors and hospitals in your time, you have to sit or stand in some cases with your patient. It can be quite a labyrinth in a hospital. I have spent some time running up and down corridors trying to find the particular room I was supposed to be in. And people can be quite anxious. I don't know, I hate going to doctors and nurses and hospitals myself, but 
most people, unless it's a sort of routine check for someone, a pregnant lady, um, or it's just a normal inoculation, but if it's something a little bit more worrying, people can be very anxious. And again, there you need to be a sort of calming presence, someone who can just say what's being said, be very clear, and help the person maybe get through this, which might sometimes be a bit of an ordeal. And sometimes, of course, for decorum's sake, they pull a curtain across. And the patient is behind the curtain with the doctor or the nurse doing whatever they're doing. And you're sort of calling through instructions like, you know, lift your arm, left leg. Can you turn over? Cough, please. Breathe in and out. And so you need to be able to do that, although, again, you're not actually seeing your patient. Uh, and it's, it's very uh, sort of disembodied in a way because you're there, but you're not there. You just have to get used to those circumstances. Now, meeting the clients. The first thing uh, is obviously to get there, which can be a challenge in itself. You generally have a name of a client, which is useful. Uh, you may not be given very much more information than that. Often I turn up in court and I don't know what sort of a case it's going to be. I'll know that it's a language. I know whether it's Italian or French, because I work with both. But it could be a mention, it could be a short trial, it could be a sentencing. And all those are slightly different. Equally, at a hospital, you probably have a bit of a better idea, because you'll be told it's the oncology ward, or you'll be told you're going to Moorfields Eye Hospital and it's the cataracts. Um, clinic and so you will have a better idea and, and be better able to prepare uh, what else again see uh, the address you need to have the address you're going to you can obviously look that up I have been to the wrong place in the past most embarrassing contact details sometimes trains are late buses are late and you need to be able to contact people and tell them you need your ID pen and paper a form sometimes if you don't have the right form on you you won't get paid an appropriate dress, I think something sober, nothing, no jingly jangly jewellery that's going to irritate you and anyone you're working with, and nothing too ostentatious. And food and drink, I have spent many hours in police stations where there is very little provision for interpreters, no really tea or coffee facilities, and so it's quite good to have something to eat and drink and to read. And introduce yourself. The first thing, the first impressions are very important. First, shake someone's hand if that's appropriate, if they haven't broken it or something. Um, say hello, introduce, give them their name and make sure they know who you are and what you're there for, that you're there to work for them. Basic rules, I think these probably are fairly go without saying. You need to be faithful. You need to say what is being said. It's very different to talk about someone pushing, someone shoving, someone thumping, someone hitting, punching, kicking. They're all on the same spectrum but they're all different and they all have different implications and people will make different decisions based on that. A jury will find, a different, um, find differently if someone has been punched or if someone has just been shoved. There is a, there's a difference there and you need to render those differences in the other language. Also the register, if someone's being very polite, I think it's only right that you're polite. Equally, if someone's using the F word, it's no good you saying, oh, he said, go away, when actually he said, F off. You know, it's very, very different. And people need to know what was actually said, not because you have some problem with saying it. So you have to overcome any hesitations you might have about saying words using language that you might not necessarily use in your day-to-day -day life. Confidential, like my letters from the Italian, you obviously don't mention it. You need to be clear. You're often working in a big space, not as big as this, but you may or may not have microphones. People may or may not be taking notes, and you need to make sure everyone can follow. You need to be professional in your dress, in your behaviour, your demeanour towards people. Basically, you're nobody's friend. You're there to help everyone who wants help from you, but you shouldn't be partial to one person or the other, hence the next one. You may not like the murderer sitting next to you. You may not like what he or she has done. You may, not, you may think the person you're working for is telling a lot of cobblers, is telling, you know, porky pies, a lot of lies, and you may have to say them in your own language for that person. But that doesn't mean to say that you should be partial. You just have to be that person for that time, whatever he or she is saying. And that's, that can be quite difficult. You use the first and second person. You become the person saying, the, what is, I did this, I did that. And the question is, did you do this? Did you do that? And you mirror that in your speech. And you say, if you don't know. Basic skills, uh, again, fairly obvious. Excellent English and your other language or languages. 
You can, that should be spoken and written. You can prepare yourself glossaries. There are a lot of online uh, resources now, a lot of websites you can go to to help you prepare for a particular assignment you might have. You need strong nerves. <coughs> you can be standing up. I have given evidence for several days on the trot where you're standing in a quite a confined space with someone who you may or may not get on with, but you have to be quite cozied up to them, if you like, while they're giving evidence and you're giving evidence next to them. And you have to sort of expect the unexpected. I once dealt with a Frenchman on Friday, and his name was Jean, something or other, surname. And then on Monday, he turned up at another court, and he was called Claude. And it was the same person. And I had to swallow my reaction, which was, I'm, I mustn't, you know, I wanted to say, but didn't we meet on Friday, and your name was Jean? So I had to just, be, again, you have to slightly expect the unexpected and just get on with the job you're being asked to do. You need good hearing, people skills, and patience. I think those all probably go without saying. Courts can be very interesting places, a lot of drama going on there. Um, the whole process of swearing in the jury, swearing in the defendant, and then the very tense moment when the verdict comes, and that's when I have had a lot of uh, people in tears, tears of joy because they're being acquitted, tears of anger when they're being sent to prison for eight years, and you need to be there beside the person helping them cope with that. <coughs> Similarly, a police interview, that can be quite, uh, take a long time, People feel differently about police officers where, depending on the country they come from, not everyone likes the Bobby on the beat, not everyone trusts the police, and you have to remember that. Here, I think we have quite a good relationship with the police in general, but that may not be the case for all of you. Becoming a PSI, a PS interpreter. Well, qualifications, as ever. Uh, you can get some qualifications here at the University of Westminster, other universities. I think this is all going to be made available, I believe, so don't worry about copying it down. The Chartered Institute of Linguists that I belong to and other organisations run the DPSI, which is the Diploma in Public Service Interpreting, and also the Diploma in Police Interpreting, as it's now called. You can sign up with agencies. They will have a minimum number of hours, but I know my colleague Joanna is going to talk about that um, later on this morning. The different, there are different agencies here, Capita, the big word, Language Line, they all use interpreters, and join professional bodies. And students, of course, get re reduced rates on um, professional bodies, so that can be quite a lure, and they hold a lot of events, networking events and others. The other thing <coughs> would be to get yourself a business card at some stage, because it's very handy to give out your business card in appropriate situations. And I myself have professional indemnity, because you just never know what's going to happen. Preparation. Court, you can go to the public gallery, you can follow events, prepare your glossaries, do lots of online research. Work, Joanna will deal with that. Work is very hard to get work until you have, it's always the catch-22. We can't take you on until you've got work experience, but someone will deal with that. And keep practicing your languages. Why become a public service interpreter? Well, it's fascinating. It's absolutely brilliant. It's all completely different. And the same thing never happens twice. Every case is unique. Every person has their individual story. Every place you work is a new challenge to get there, to deal with it. And every job, genuinely, in 18 years, every job I take something away, even if it's just a new bit of vocab. But generally, it's something a bit more profound about how to deal with certain situations. And I find it endlessly stimulating. And then the million-dollar question, how much do you earn? Well, police rates are quite good. They pay more like, uh, again, it slightly depends on the different constabularies, about £30 an hour and travel expenses and travel costs. Uh, capita and the, the big word pay more like 20 to 22 pounds. Health services, sadly, the least well paid of the sectors. Sometimes I've been offered as little as 16 pounds as well. It does sound quite a lot, but you've got to factor in that you've got to get to these places and then get back again. And sometimes they don't pay for your travel costs either. Um, and freelance rates, well, always ask for as much as you possibly can, is my advice. <laughs> Oh, I hope, I'm sorry it's been a bit of a gallop through an overview of public service interpreting, but I hope that's given you a general idea. And I know there's a question-answer session at the end of the morning when, if you do have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Lovely. Thank you, Rose, for that fascinating insight into your working life. Um, now I'm handing over to Joanna Waller.
who's going to have a look at yes the how money. you break through the, the money and, thing. Uh, yes, yeah, no, the money. Money. Thank you. Morning, everybody. So this is this is the bottom line. This is this is the, what you can expect to get from this job. Um, so um, I've been at it for well since I was at school, which is a long time ago, sometime in the mid 70s, when I started working. Sorry, when I started working for money as a translator. So I'm a translator. I don't do interpreting. I've done an odd bit of interpreting. I have got one or two things to say about interpreting, but you've already had a really good intro from Rose, um, and there's lots and lots of information available. But a lot of what I say about translating um, in this talk and the next one will also apply to interpreting. So I'm going to talk to you about how much you can earn and how you go about deciding what you're worth. That's, that's quite important. Uh, and also how you go about um, boosting what you can earn, ways of getting... You, know, you might start off on a low rate, but how do you get to those higher echelons where people apparently earn, you know, whatever, £100,000 a year or something like that? Well, we'll see. So I'm talking to talk about pricing translations, um, how, you, how you calculate what a translation should... How, how to price it, what, what your price should be, what you're actually, what you're actually um, charging for the work you're doing. So not just the words you're translating, but there's more to it than that. And then other services that you might... Um, provide like proofreading and revising and editing and so on and also briefly pricing interpreting so it's what am I worth that's the big question and adding value as I said so how do I make myself more productive how can I get the same money um, or better money for doing the, s more, the same amount of work for doing it better or for doing it quicker so I'm earning my rate per hour goes up even though the, I might um, and I can cram more into my day I'm quite Noted for that. I do a lot of cramming in. How do I get more money? There we go. So you have to work it out. Start off with the bottom line. You've all got, um, you've got somewhere to live and you've got bills to pay and you might have a family to support. Um, so how do I, I, first of all, I have to decide how much do I need? How much do I want to earn? Um, so that means your outgoings, how, what your bills are, what your, your rent or your mortgage are and everything else, and so you therefore need, to start with, you need that bottom line, you need your minimum pay that you can earn, and you might be able to earn that, you know, working in a shop or, or in an office or something like that, um, but if you're, I'm talking, I'm generally talking about working freelance, because I've worked all, I've always worked freelance, I've never been employed as a translator, I've always done it on my own, I've been employed doing other things, but not translating, um, so in order to do that, you need to translate a certain number of words per month, and then work out the cost. If, you know, so how much per word will give me this bottom line of what I need to earn? And that's, that's your minimum. I'm sure some people are better at maths than I am. I employ a bookkeeper, by the way. My, one of my luxuries, I've got others, but one of my luxuries is somebody who comes to my house about once every three months and takes this big pile of paper that I've kept for her and then works it out and to make sense of it and hands it over to the tax man and tells me how much money I've actually earned. Absolutely indispensable, well worth every penny. There's lots of places you can find out how much you could be earning and how much you... And these will all be made available. You don't need to take notes. Everything's available and passed on to you after this. So this is one of... This is the London Freelance Organisation, which is freelance fees, generally, across the board, not just translating, but all kinds of things. And then ProZed, which is... Um, which can give you an idea. And that's a link to something that tells you about what people are likely to pay rates you get on pro <coughs> actually this gives a reasonably good picture of what you can earn but obviously I'm sure most of you know if you've looked at it already the rates on pro or any of these websites are really really low they, they, you're, you're basically bidding down to get the work and then there's always this <laughs> um, and if somebody says to you well you know why do I need to pay you all this money because I can just put it into Google Translate you know give them an example what it might look like, you know, um, even as something as simple as a menu card from a French restaurant translated into um, English. Um, I have seen, I've seen that done, and it said, um, what was it, something like Biftec and its furniture, <laughs> by which I think they meant garniture, in other words, you know, the, the sort of trimmings and all the bits that, that you get on the plate along with it. 
So what you get with your steak and its furniture, I'm not quite sure, but anyway. So that's, that's what people think about translating, and there's more and more of that now. And there's the danger of the post-editing um, trap, where people say, well, we've had it translated, all we want you to do is tidy it up, and we'll pay you a half or a third, whatever, of the, of the normal rate for translating, because all you're doing is tidying it up. That's a big, that's a trap, and, but it happens a lot, and it's happening more and more. So you need to look out for that. And I will have something to say about how you pitch yourself as well to get away from that end of the market. So pricing translations. Translations are normally based on the volume of the text, so how many words, basically. Some people, sometimes you get paid per hour, um, but that is, it's usually the number of words. And then there's other text-based services, so revising, proofreading, the layout, making, putting a document into the format that your customer wants. You might have a, a simple, straightforward um, Word document with just the text, and they say, well, actually, we want it laid out in this way with these pictures. You might sometimes get asked to do that. Uh, and you can specialise in it. I mean, that's another option. And then there's things like transcription and voiceover, um, where you'll get paid. Usually, again, for that, you get paid per hour. And you might be working for a company that provides you with the software and has a sort of uh, timer system on it, you know, where you clock in and out, so they know how long you've been working, those kind of things. And then there's an hourly rate, and as I said, you sometimes for those kind of other text-based services, you'll get paid an hourly rate. And then the customer has to trust you, and if you say, I've spent three hours working on this, they have to trust you. Um, but that will depend on your relationship with your client. These are some... These are quite old, some of these, but things haven't changed a great deal. The rates have gone up, I find, slightly in the last couple of years. I've got a few tables which ITI and COIO did the survey a few years ago. Um, there's various um, comparison rates you can see there where um, conference interpreting rates, translating rates. Um, that one won't go down. That's it. Um, and so there's a, a variety of... of figures which are difficult to apply to per personally to your own um, particular circumstances that gives you a, a general idea but as I said this is about four years old um, in terms of the um, so I'm not I as far as interpreting rates here, I'm not sure if these still apply but they may well not have changed a great deal public surfacing but uh, obviously Rose has covered this already um, and as you can see that they're very varied and of course it depends on the language because um, in generally speaking, that freelance um, London freelance site that I mentioned on the that talks about the different bands. So there's Group One, Group Two, Group Three, um, and then so you're talking about French, Spanish, Italian, Western European languages in this country into English tend to be paid at the lowest rate. And then the further away you go geographically, and also um, obviously uh, languages with other alphabets and so on and so forth, they tend to get paid higher rates in this country and then out of English into again that will be higher, higher again so you get little steps according to what people are prepared to pay and some of it's rarity value so um, obviously there's loads and loads and loads of us who do French, Spanish and Italian which are my three languages um, or German so loads and loads of people in this country who do those languages so you're actually you know your market is, is flooded really with people who can do the work you can do um, but if you're doing something Arabic, say, or um, Eastern European languages, um, and then further afield into the, into the Far East and into sort of Chinese and Korean and so on, you'll get paid more for those, usually. Um, this is a very useful little booklet. You may have already have seen it. ITI produces um, called Getting It Right, which is a way of, and it's downloadable, and it's in a multi multitude of languages nowadays, um, and it's a useful tool to give to your customers. If your customers are a, a Google Translate user and they aren't, say, say why do we have, say, offer them this and say, this is why. It gives a very, very good introduction to customers as to what they should be looking for in a good translator um, and why a good translator is worth their weight in gold, which we all are, of course. So adding value. Well, obviously, one of the things... Um, the first thing you do, most of us in our daily lives as translators, we use a computer. We, we use word processing. So the first thing to make sure is that you are really, really good at using your computer. Really good at it. And that you know how it works, you know all the little shortcuts and the little tweaks, and you are a very, very good touch typist, if that's what you do. Um, most people are these days, most people learn typing at school on an ordinary keyboard. 
In my generation, we didn't. You had to go and do touch typing courses if you're going to be a secretary. And I went, but I did a touch typing course when, when I started, and I was a very early user of a computer. Um, and I learned to type really fast, so that, that speeded up my output. If you're a slow typist, you will be a slow translator. If you can, I mean, I can type, I can produce as fast as I can read a French text, say, I can produce it in English almost as fast as I can read it. So my output is very high. My first draft, my raw first draft, is very fast to produce, usually. Um, and then you obviously, that, the, the, you add in the time it takes to edit it and, and check everything and so on and so forth. Um, so the that's the first thing to do. And also be very sure of your software. I'll talk a bit in a minute about translation memory. Um, your language skills obviously have to be superb. You have to really know your stuff, um, really know the nuances of everything, really know your subject areas. And that's another um, very important. Know the terminology so that you're not constantly looking things up. Obviously, you get, a, you get a text that's something you've not covered before, a new aspect of your specialist, spe specialist knowledge. Um, you will take a while to get familiar with it and, or with customer-specific terminology. Um, make sure that whenever you're receiving a document from a client, you ask, is there a glossary? Is there reference material? What does the customer normally use for these terms? So that you're not translating everything according to what you think and then being told you know, the following day, oh, actually, the customer always calls this gadget that, not this. You know, so, so, and then you have to go through and correct everything. So you have to make sure that you've got anything that the customer particularly wants, make sure you've got that. Um, as far as adding value is concerned, adding languages and adding subject areas in particular are really good ways of adding value. And you can decide when you're starting out, you've got your initial specialisms, it might be medical, it might be law, it might be engineering, it might be IT, whatever it is. But as, you go, as time goes on, you can add in new specialisms, and there might be new things you get interested in, or it might occur to you that uh, your partner's specialist subject is actually quite a lucrative area for you. I started off with an arts degree and arts knowledge, knew nothing at all, was hopeless at science or anything scientific, but I happened to have a partner who is an electronic engineer, and this is in 1976, sort of 1980s, when everything was taking off. All this technology, you know, mobile phones, um, everybody's computers are getting faster and faster and quicker and quicker, the internet, everything like that. Um, and he was there in the middle of it. He was the person who designed the chips that go inside the boxes. That was his job. And so that's what I decided to specialise in. So everything I did to start with, he checked everything and helped me and taught me. And I went to courses at the university where he worked and learned from his colleagues how to, you know, what all this stuff was about and how it worked. Um, and so that became my specialist area. Mobile, mobile data <coughs> and telephony became my specialist area in the 1980s. And I just flew with the technology because that's what I happened to decide to do. Um, but then later on, that's all done now all those infrastructures. I spent years translating um, the uh, tender documents for the companies that were putting mobile technology and infrastructure into northern, northern uh, Af North Africa, all those French people, into South America. I spent years translating all that stuff. Now it's all there, and it's being upgraded, but generally speaking, there's far less work available in that area for me. So I'm moving into other areas now, and I can talk about those later on in my next session. But I can, but so I, I deliberately took the decision to move into other areas. The other reason for doing that is because so much of this stuff is now in English anyway, and originally produced in English. I'm an, I'm an inter-English translator, so there's less work available for me in that way. The other thing is that um, computer-aided translation is getting better, and quite a lot of this technical stuff is actually translated quite well using computer-aided uh, translation now. So voiceover and transcription, that's other skills that you can add. Um, all these kind of things will give you more customers, more options, make you more saleable. If a translation company takes you on and you say, well, I've got two languages, one of them's French, but one of them is also Arabic or Korean or something less, less common. I've also, I'm very good at this particular area of technology, but I also know something about music, then you're much more saleable. Oh, and by the way, I can also do voiceover and transcription. So you're even more saleable. Translation memory, absolutely essential. In all, I'm sure you know this, you're all coming out of an MA course and you all know this, but absolutely essential and getting really good at it and staying up to date and doing some training. It, 
I use it all the time, every single day for practically every single kind of text. Obviously for texts that involve a lot of repetition and, or, or are sort of very uh, formulaic. But I also use it for all kinds of other texts because of the discipline it imposes on the way I work, because of the consistency it gives me in my terminology, because I can have translation memories for particular customers, so I never need to check back and say, oh, what did that customer say? Where was that glossary? Where did I keep it? It's all there in my translation memory. So I really recommend translation memory. I bought translation, my first translation memory in 1997, I bought Tredos Workbench when it was first out, and I've never looked back, so now I've got nearly 20 years worth of translation memory, and I use it all the time, it's fantastic, in all three languages. And as I said before, typing, voice recognition is very good. If you are comfortable using that, or if it's better for you because you might have a particular need for it, you can't sit down at the desk too long, or your eyesight isn't so brilliant, or anything like that, then voice recognition software is actually very good now. Um, I've left a couple of translation memory. Omega T is a freebie. It's not brilliant, but it's free. So if you want to try it out and have something at home that you can use, it's, very, it's, it's well worth doing. And then, obviously, Trados is expensive, but it's the, to some extent, it's the market standard. MemoQ as well. WordFast is cheaper and, and also cleverly. And they're all open source, so everything's compatible with everything else, or in theory it is anyway. Right. So how do you get the money out of the customer? When you've got all this, done all this work, at the end of the month, you have to bill them. This will all be available. So you get, the certain things are legally required on an invoice. And this is, this is more or less it. Um, and also, you, sometimes customers have different ways of it. Some customers want you to bill them online on their own company <coughs> system. So when you've done the job, you upload it to their system, and then you go into their billing area and you do that. But you still need to keep your own records for your own tax purposes and for you know, keeping your own books and so on. So you do need to have this information in an accessible form in some way or other. Um, I like to produce my invoices using Excel, and then I send the customer a PDF, I email them a PDF, of the, so that they have a fixed version. This is what I'm charging. You can dispute it if you like, but that's what the bottom line is. Um, you have to say it's an invoice. If it's not an invoice, if they, for instance, they haven't paid you and you're sending them a reminder, change the word invoice to reminder or statement in red with exclamation marks after it. And when are you going to pay me? Written underneath it, things like that. Um, a unique identification number so you can track it. The customer's reference number, so that will be the purchase order, the job number, whatever they gave you, so they can track it in their system. And then your rate, so the unit amounts per word or per thousand words, and the total amount for that job. What I normally do is... For each customer, I send them one invoice a month. So if I've done four jobs for a customer, I'll have four lines on the invoice and then the totals. The VAT is applicable. So when you get to the point of having to become VAT registered, um, you have to add the VAT as a separate item. And your payment terms at the bottom. So I, you know, I require payment within 30 days. I am aware of my legal rights and I will take action if necessary. You can put that in the bottom, that kind of wording. There's a standard formula from, that the EU provides for small businesses, which you can, you can look up. And, and that, and you, so you make it clear that you will chase them for the money if, they're not gonna, if they don't pay you. And then your bank account details, your payment details. If it's going abroad, you need your IBAN number, the, the international bank identification number and so on. So you put all that on there so they can pay you and they've got no excuse not to pay you. There we go. So basically... You have to be sure that you are worth employing. So you are the best possible translator, interpreter you can be. You make it your business to be professional. You make it your business to get the job done. One of the things I hammer home, and I will talk about that in the next talk, is you, you are taking a problem off somebody's shoulders and you are solving it for them. Don't give them another problem in return. So don't be late. Don't be messy. Don't be inaccurate. Don't be difficult. Get your customers to get to know you. One of the things I find really useful is to chat to the customers, not in a kind of discursive way, not, get to, not send them great long screeds of emails about how my cat is doing or how my children are doing, whatever. You just say, hi, you know, um, thanks for the job, uh, sunny day here, I've got to stay in and work, oh dear, how's the weather with you, that kind of thing. Get to know them, especially if you're dealing with the same project manager all the time. You gradually get to know them and you get comfortable with them, and, they'll, and they, be, they, they come to think of you in their head, oh, that's the person who's really nice to deal with. Oh, she's never difficult. He's always got something cheerful to say. He'll, you know, he'll send me a joke on a Friday afternoon, that kind of thing. So 
and, they'll, and so you're the, you're the one they go to. Be the go-to person. So be confident in what you can offer them. You know you're giving them a good job. You want them to know you. You want them to get, and you want, so then you're worth, then you're worth employing. Now I have a triple, when somebody brings you up or emails you and says, I've got this job, um, 10,000 words um, for, you know, 48 hours turnaround time uh, and we'll pay you, you know, peanuts. You say, fine. Okay, right, I'll write that down. Um, I can do, I can work fast. I can stay up all night. I can, I can meet your deadline. That's fine. Okay, that's great. I'll, I'll do that for you. I'll meet your deadline. Um, but, um, and I can be cheap if you want me to be. If they send you a job and they say, well, we've, only, we've got a limited budget and we can only afford to pay you half rates this time, is that okay? Okay, fine, I can be cheap. And I can also be extremely good. I can be the best one you've ever had. I'm really, I know my job, I know all my terminology, I know everything. I'll really give you a good job. I can do two out of three of those, but not all three. So if you want this done cheap, I'll send it you at the end of the month, you know, in three weeks' time, when I fit it in alongside everything else. But it'll still be good, because I'm good. I can give you a really good job really fast, but it'll mean I have to stay up late, and I'll have to work all weekend, so it's going to cost you an absolute fortune. Okay? And I can be... What the, I can't remember, what was the third algorithm then? Fast, cheap, and good, anyway, all three. I can be really good, and I can be cheap, but it'll take ages. I can be really cheap, and I can be fast, but it won't be very good, that's the third one. It might be hopeless, it might be full of spelling mistakes, um, and I'll have to get it done really quickly, because then I've got to go and do something else more important, and the customer's going to pay me properly. So any two out of three, you can, you can work that one with the customer. So warn them before you start. If somebody asks you to do the impossible, you know, we can do the impossible, but it takes a little longer and it will cost you a lot more money. Anybody know where this comes from? Half a million dollars, shouted Montclair, rising from his seat. You are crazy. No, said the Englishman calmly, but I am the best and therefore the most expensive. Does anybody know where the quote comes from? Pardon? Good film. And an excellent book, if you've not read it. Okay? He was an assassin, in case you haven't read it. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Lovely. Everyone's been wonderfully on time today, so thank you very much. Um, Joanna will be speaking again this afternoon, and um, you can now, yes, I think one minute early, actually go for the break, and then if you could come back promptly afterwards, and we'll continue. Thank you.
Two. Two.
two, two, one, two.
ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats quickly, please. Okay, I think we're ready to begin again. If I could have your attention, please. Uh, could I just ask that if anyone came in late and uh, just took their name badge without being ticked off on our list, could you, um, at the start of the lunch break, find somebody to tick you off so that we know that you're here? Thank you very much. Um, right, we're going to carry on now with Rick Grant, who's going to introduce you to Transcreation. Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Pleased to meet you. I hope you guessed my name. Um, I'm Rick Grant. I'm one of the Transcreation Directors and uh, Head of New Business for World Writers. I can see someone smiling. They obviously got the reference. Fantastic. Um, needless to say, um, as introduced by Jane, I'm here to talk about Transcreation. Um, I certainly remember when I was sat in a lecture theatre, not unlike this one, um, with a degree in my embittered hand, wondering, okay, with my language degree, what the hell am I gonna do with myself? Um, transcreation, uh, the idea of it, the notion of it, was certainly something that was absolutely unknown to me at the time. Um, so in a way, uh, to follow a quote from a film, I'm just gonna try and give you the choice that I never had. <clears throat> First step, obviously, is understanding what translation and transcreation are. Now, um, having worked on you know, your courses, I'm sure you're very familiar with the notion of translation in terms of uh, uh, an exchange of information from one language to another, often in a one-to-one -one method. Um, transcreation is a different creature entirely, um, and I could you know, stand here and talk to you all day, but sometimes it's much easier to explain that visually, to give you examples, to really solidify the idea. So to borrow an analogy, if we think of language as dough, then with that dough, we can make bread. Um, and much like bread, translation is essential for the world in general. You know, there's uh, translation of the instruction manuals for your mobile phone, your laptop, um, ingredients lists on the back of a can of Coke or a, a box of biscuits. Translation is required, it is necessary, it is as essential as bread is for the world. Now, everybody needs it, everybody uses it, and of course, you know, the art of translation will never die in that sense. Um, transcreation, well, you know, what is that? Surely it's, you know, the same kind of thing. Well, not quite. Now, I'm not going to say that translation is... Um, something where you know, you're making bread with finer ingredients or it's much more of an artisan product that's more expensive. It is more expensive, but for different reasons entirely. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it, it, it's not that, it's more of a different methodology. The way that it's made is inherently different to the way that translation is. So you know, transcreation is you know, all the varieties, all the different things that you see. Um, and, I'm, and I'm talking specifically here about a local level. For example, if you walk into a boulangerie and you ask for a focaccia and someone gives you a ciabatta, you know it's wrong. Yeah, sure, it's bread. It's made with the same ingredients, and, you know, largely the same process, but it's not what you were looking for. Um, it's not the same as what you had in mind. This, kind of, this example really reflects um, what I see with local clients when they're asking for one thing in one language and they're not necessarily getting it. And if you look at this in a translation sense, you could argue that, okay, well, you know, it says exactly what it's supposed to say. This translation is accurate. But when we delve into the realm of transcreation, it's the realm of subjectivity. Everything is, is questionable. If you think of all these products on the right-hand side, um, I'm sure many of which you're familiar with from the various cultures in which you hail, um, they all are unique. Uh, they, have, they have something about them, a certain je ne sais quoi. They have personality. And personality is something that is massively important to really understanding and executing transcreation. Personality makes an impact. Um, why is personality important? Why am I talking about personality? What, a lot of what we do, um, you know, specifically our company and anyone who looks at transcreation, is enabling brands to speak to the local audiences in the right way. So the tonality is maintained, the sentiment is maintained. The key thing there is the personality. 
Every brand has a personality, whether you realize it or not. If I put an example in front of you, these four brands, chances are you have an idea that pops to mind of what these brands look like, what these brands mean, what their ethos is. If I was to personify these as people, what would they look like? Maybe they look a little bit like this. Thank <laughs> thankfully, nobody's dressed like this in the room because that would have been really embarrassing. <clears throat> now, I'm sure some of you will have uh, you know, differences. They'll look at that and you'll think, oh, well, that's not quite in line with what I have in my head, but I'd be willing to bet that it's not far off. So the, the, one of the first things for transcreation is to really understand you know, the personality of the brands, to understand who they are, what they are, what they're about, what they're not, um, and what they're not trying to communicate. You need to understand that before you can do anything with regards to transcreation, because if you misinterpret the brand, your translation, your, your language adaptation is going to fall flat on its face. So this is the key thing here about understanding personality. And you'll see as I walk through the examples why this is increasingly important. So personality. Um, as a company, we have a personality, of course, um, and we are quite well known across the world. If any of our clients talk to us, they're usually going to ask us the same five questions. The, the who, what, when, where, and why. Who are we? Well, my company, World Writers, we're one of the world's leading transcreation agencies. What exactly do we do? We give brands a voice irrespective of where they're coming from, where they're going, where they're trying to go, and where they think they're trying to go. We've been doing this since 1989, so we've got quite a lot of experience in, in managing transcreation for some of the world's largest brands. We're based here in glorious London, over in Clerkenwell, um, but we also have some hubs internationally as well, as you would imagine, with a company who looks after language. These are all interesting factoids, I'm sure, but the most important thing is why. Why do we exist? It's very simple, because we get it. If you look at our website, it has the, that title underneath the logo. We understand what it means to transcreate something. When a company comes to us and says, here is my brand campaign, here is my, 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 my multimedia execution for TV, print, digital, and I want this to work in 30 languages, and I want it to work flawlessly. I want people to look at the advert and laugh at the right point. I want them to smile at the right point. I want them to remember it 20 years later. This is where transcreation comes in. So where does an organization like us fit in the world of language and the world of production? I'll give you a very simplified um, view of the world. With my, uh, any media campaign from in the advertising world, you're gonna have the big idea, usually made by the creative agency. Sometimes uh, the client will have in-house creatives who work on that. Either way, they're gonna develop the big idea. That idea is gonna underpin the entire campaign, and that could be rolled out across any media type. And they'll develop that campaign and they'll say, hey, right, we need to transcreate this. We know that we've got 30 markets who are going to need this advertising and we need it to work because obviously if you're marketing a product, you want to sell it. If you don't sell the product, your marketing has failed. So they decide we need to transcreate it. So that's when a firm like us will come in and we provide the transcreation. Once that language content is assembled, that will then go to the next stage in production, whether that is recording the voiceover, whether that's um, uh, putting the subtitles to picture, um, setting up an InDesign file for, the, for a brochure or for an out-of-home ad, getting that uh, production handled. And then, of course, once you've achieved that, you've effectively taken the big idea through the medium of language and then transitioned that into media fulfillment across the variety of channels that are required. And that's a very, you know, anybody who you know, works in advertising would look at this and say, put their hand up and start asking me questions. This is a very simplified view of the advertising world. But just so you can get a general sense of where we fit, where we sit with regards to production. <clears throat> I said before about personality and identity. Um, and obviously, you know, as a company with our own identity, much in the same way that any client or any brand has their identity as well. Um, another step into understanding transcreation is knowing why certain things won't work in a certain way. So to give you an example, here are two ads. So on the left-hand side, English, ever reliable and damn tasty, just like me. Bang on. Now I'm sure you'll agree there is an inherent Englishness in that ad. Um, it works, and for anybody sat here, you know, in the UK who is who is English, they're going to understand, you know, what it's referring to, with or without Rick Mayer. Um, but if we transmit that somewhere else, if we put that in Spain, we put that in Russia, we put that in Ukraine, chances are they're not going to get it. Even if you transcreate it the chances are it's not going to communicate very well. Why? Because the core concept doesn't resonate in the way that it should, because it's utilizing an inherently English um, uh, personality and traits to sell something. If the target market does not understand that, then of course it's not going to work. The same with the ad on the right-hand side. La nouvelle smooth. Now if, like me, you only speak un petit pois of French, um, <laughs> you're, you're not necessarily going to, you know, 
appreciate how that works. I mean, in, uh, in an English-speaking world, especially in the UK at least, in America, um, the use of a little bit of French is seen as exotic. Um, there's a little je ne sais quoi there and something a bit special. So people look at that and they think, oh, how, how chic, how European. <laughs> but conversely, if we take that, and of course any French speaker will, will tell me if I'm wrong, that that just says the new smooth. So if we translate smooth en français, and then we have the whole line, la nouvelle, whatever the word is, smooth is, it's not going to work because it just says the new smooth. It suddenly it's lost any sense of um, exoticism, mysticism, um, or any chicness or cosmopolitan kind of feel whatsoever. So again, as a piece of advertising, it will not work. So these two examples, you could try to transcreate them, but I can tell you for nothing that you're not going to be able to do it because the core concept is not aimed at the right, it is not generated within the right way. Go ahead, take the call, I'll wait. <laughs> so, we'll take an example of, of, of something that we're going to attempt to transcreate here. Now you can start getting excited. Um, hopefully, you know this brand. I'm sure some of you are wearing our products right now, hopefully. Um, just do it. Uh, you've, seen all, you've seen this a million times, and I'm sure many of you will know that this isn't something that is localized if you look at Nike's website. I wonder why. Let's have a look. Now, when we're preparing any transcreation, um, one of the first things you know, we need to understand, like I said earlier on, is the background, to know what this personality is. You know, who is this brand? You know, let's say that you're from Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia and you're not necessarily familiar with sporting brands. How are you, as a translator or a copywriter, going on to understand a brand that someone in France or Germany will understand inherently without even looking at any reference to it? Oh, Nike, yeah, I know what I need to do. If you're in a market that doesn't understand that, you've no idea. And of course, that's not your fault as a translator or a copywriter. It's merely something that you're not privy to. So how do we go about informing our copywriters so that we can achieve transcreation the right way? We use something called a brief. The first step is to understand the brand. Understand the brand, who the brand is, their history, where they've come from, where they're going, um, all sorts of background information about the campaign and so on and so forth. Now, um, this you, know, you can find out from looking on Wikipedia, on any brand in the world, I would wager. But what about just do it? What about the tagline? Let's imagine that we're going to transcreate that tagline into Italian. I'm sure there's some Italian speakers in the room. <clears throat> so there's things that we know about the brand. We know the tone of voice for this particular brand. And what would we say it is? I'm sure you'd agree and say that it's, it's energetic, it's uplifting, it's dynamic. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Emphasizes sportsmanship and health, as well as performance. Target audience. Who are we talking to? Who is Nike talking to? I'm talking about demographic, I'm talking about age, talking about gender. It's everyone. Yeah, they want to target absolutely everyone. There's no, they make no distinction between you know, someone who's middle-aged and someone who's a teenager. You know, if people want to get active and get sporty, that's what they're aiming for. They want them to seize that. This, this piece of advertising, this just do it, what's the usage? Where is it going to go? Now, there's a difference, a distinct difference between having a line that looks good and a line that sounds good. You know, just because you, if, you, if you imagine a TV commercial and you've got a voiceover, the way that it sounds to you is going to be very different to writing a sentence. Yeah? So you wouldn't necessarily put the same line on a print ad that you would with something that's going for TV or even for radio. Radio is even harder because you have no visuals at all. It's relying entirely on the speaker's voice, much like this presentation is relying entirely on my voice right now. So this usage, let's say this tagline is going to appear on all advertising collateral, print, broadcast, digital. So we know we need to make this tagline work across multiple media formats. Now, um, <clears throat> the most interesting thing, the brief. Just do it. One of your friends comes to you and says, hey, I, I, this, this brand Nike, you know, I've always wondered in English, what is it in this sentence? What would you define it as? Anybody care to hazard a guess? Sorry? Okay. Yeah, any others? Yes. What it is not is a good example of a, gram a grammatical sentence. It <clears throat> is not an object. Um, it is not you know, a, a particular item we're talking about. It is an ethos. It is a mantra. It is a challenge. It is sportsmanship. It is an ideology. It is a way of life. It is just get out there and do it. Whatever it is, do it and do it to the best of your ability. This is the creative brief that I would write for that campaign. So if I was sending this out to a copywriter, of which I hope many of you will become, this is how I would explain it. This is how I would frame that brief. And as you can see, this is absolutely essential to translating the line. If you take it in a very conventional sense and say, just do it. Okay, let's put it in Japanese. Tada dekiru kara. That's not going to work. 
because that just means just do it because you can. Ishoken me would probably work better in Japanese, which translates to to do something to the best of one's ability, which I'm sure you'll agree is much more in line with what it's actually trying to say when we get outside the semantics of what the, la what the three words actually are in the sentence. Yeah? So taking that example, <clears throat> and this is an example from the way in which we work with our copywriters. Vayoltre. Go beyond. Now, that translation is very useful if, like me, your Italian is not particularly very good. Um, but it doesn't necessarily explain everything what's going on in Vayoltre. Why are we not saying just do it? The English approver would ask you. Now, for better or for worse, English is the global language these days. You'd be surprised at how many companies, despite having Italian heritage, French heritage, originate their copy in English. Um, so th that, that English copy it then has to work in all the various languages. And let's say that the approver of Nike Europe, let's say he's a very talented man who speaks you know, three languages, but let's imagine Italian's not one of them. How is he going to make a decision on whether this is the right copy to put on 20,000 pieces of collateral that's going to be printed at a cost of you know, 50,000 pounds. How is he going to make that decision? Just on that back translation? No. This is why we have something called a rationale. This is the Rosetta Stone for transcreation. This is the means by which we sell the advertising lines which we create, or which our copywriter creates. Um, in my experience, the shorter the English line, the longer the rationales tend to be, because you're trying to wedge so much more creative sentiment into the line, which from the examples I've just given, I'm sure is starting to make sense to you. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to produce another option. Nessuna scusa. No excuse. Again, a rationale to explain exactly what's going on. Why did we not use the word just? Why did we not use the word do it? Why did we make those concessions creatively? That is where we explain it. That is the, the art of transcreation. Now, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, and then Italian speakers, please tell me if you don't, or if you, if you have a better option, because then I can add it to this deck and update it afterwards. Um, <clears throat> these options work. Sure, they don't say, just do it. But they were never going to, because it's never going to work on a one-to-one -one basis. That is the difference for translation and transcreation. So we have two options here, which say you know, exactly what the brand is trying to communicate, albeit in a different way. And let's say the client chooses to go with it, and suddenly we end up with a tagline like that. Now, there's a reason why Nike hasn't transcreated any of those lines, because it's very tricky. Brands want consistency. They want to have you know, a core message that works across all the markets in the world, or as many as they can. What they do not want is rogue uh, local approvers creating their own lines, which happens more than, you, more than you believe. So they will produce whatever they want to sell their product, even if it's not on brand or doesn't work with the core creative that is developed. So you know, centralized language production um, is something which you know, firms like ours uh, get very heavily involved in. And clients come to us because they want consistency in messaging. They don't just want to give it to a freelancer in Italy, a freelancer in Spain, and have them do whatever they want to do because it doesn't create a cohesive brand message for which they want to put out. They want their website to look almost identical in all the languages. They want it to feel the same. Yeah? So, <clears throat> to finish with, I'm going to give you another example of um, a press piece. We're going to assemble it bit by bit and look at why it doesn't work, why in, in transcreation would be absolutely essential to make something like this work. First up, we're going to need a brand. We're going to need a product. Gibson guitars. <clears throat> I've seen some people wearing guitar t-shirts. I'm sure I've got the right target audience in here. Um, we have a product. It's very clear what the product is. But we're going to need something else. We're going to need a key visual. We're going to need something to make it pop. Okay. We've got a visual connection now. Some people are looking confused. That's a devil's pitchfork in case you've never seen one before. <clears throat> you've obviously not been to certain parts of London. Um, but we need something else to really make it work. We need a tagline to draw it all together. So from the, the little, little kind of size of laughter, I'm sure I mean, you think that this works. Speak of the devil. We've got a simple connection hinged on the visual, and it works with the wording. Yeah? Simple, easy. Now, obviously, being the marketing director of uh, Gibson USA, um, and not speaking any languages, I'm going to say, yeah, speak of the devil. I'm sure that they have that in all other languages. We can just put that translation on there. Can someone go on Wikipedia and fetch that for me? I can sure you can see where this is going. In certain languages, this does not work. Mia vukua vuk navrata in Croatian. Speak of the wolf. <clears throat> so suddenly you're going to have to change that completely if you think that you can simply use the same line. Shio sal sal, sal sal dao in Chinese. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, you know who this refers to. This doesn't refer to um, a wolf at all. This refers to this gentleman 
um, who is uh, a poet, warlord, uh, um, and uh, you know, very respected part of the Chinese culture, Cao Cao. Um, and the phrase says, speak of Cao Cao, and Cao Cao will appear. And whilst I'm sure that he can play pretty wicked guitar solos, he's probably not what Gibson were looking for when they were thinking of their brand ambassador. Greek, katafoni. Now, any Greek speaker here will tell me that that's not the end of the sentence, strictly speaking. That says, speak of. But the real phrase is, speak of the donkey. So again, <laughs> this isn't going to work at all. We're going to need to come up with something completely different. Japanese, uwasou suribakage, um, speak shadows, uh, sorry, speak rumors and the shadow appears. Now, it sounds very inscrutable and, and oriental and mysticism, but uh, it's not going to work with a black press ad putting a shadow on there, is it? <laughs> Hablando de Rey de Roma, speak of the, speak of the King of Rome. Um, Caligula, again, probably not the right choice for this ad, <laughs> though I do hear that Nero is very good with stringed instruments and probably would be a better candidate for going here. So this becomes, whoops, this becomes tricky. It doesn't work in the way that you would anticipate. It requires a very skilled touch to make it work. You can't just translate it on a one-to-one -one basis. This is where transcreation comes in. This is where we require <coughs> skilled copywriters who are able to digest the brief to understand what's going on with a piece of advertising communication, to really think about what it's trying to say, who it's trying to talk to, and how best to render that. Whether you're talking to teenagers, whether you're talking to you know, um, uh, people who are very interested in tech in their late 30s, you know, the, the, the copywriter's craft is being able to take that brief and, and then you know, transmute that into whatever the client requires. So looking at these examples, I'm sure you're thinking, okay, we're, we're very clever, we get the point, but what is the right transcreation? What is the right option to go up there alongside, the, alongside that piece of advertising? It's very simple. It's up to you. For if any of you choose to become copywriters, this is where you will apply your craft. This is where your transcreation will sit, supported by your back translation, supported by the rationales, the creative reasoning that you've applied when you've been sat there developing the piece and spending hours writing it. That is what transcreation is. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Rick. Um, now all your creative juices are flowing, I will pass you on back to Joanna to give you ideas about how to start. Again, right. Um, having talked to you earlier on about how to earn lots of money, I'm now going to suggest that you work for nothing. Um, so this, this phrase, Catch-22, which is another, we're all terribly cultural here. We've had films and literature and ancient history and all sorts. Obviously, this refers to a famous novel, Catch-22, and it's the, it's the dilemma of being asked, as, as uh, Rose said earlier as no, Sarah said earlier on, um, Oh, well, yes, we would, we'd love to employ you, but you haven't got any experience. So go away and get some experience, and then we'll employ you. So this is the catch-22. So I'm going to give you some ideas of how to get over that barrier if you are really starting out. I know one or two people here have been doing the job for years, and you've just come along to kind of brush up your skills and share your experience, but a lot of you are just beginning. So the first thing, you've still got to pay the bills, as we said earlier on. So keep up the day job. You can't jump off the diving board into the freelance life, self-employed life, without having some, something or going on in the background to pay the bills, or possibly somebody, if your other half is prepared to support you while you do this. And that's what I did, and he was wonderful. As I said already, in all kinds of ways, he kept everybody going, and I, when I was uh, earning really small amounts of money, it paid for family holidays. It was like the jam on the bread and butter. He did the bread and butter, I did the jam. But nowadays it's the other way around because he's kind of gone part time and he's about to retire, so I'm still do I'm still going. So I do. It's the other way around now. Um, so it's a chancy way to make a living, and so you may need to keep up the day job for quite a while. And there will come a point, the break point, where you suddenly realise actually I haven't got time to go and stack shelves in Aldi's because I'm too busy earning all this money from translating. So actually maybe I could give up the day job. So 
I'm going to talk to you about this as a way of getting started. So whilst you're earning your bread and butter, you need to be looking for experience. Um, and there is something called pro bono, working for the public good. And it's a very, very well-recognised, well-respected um, way for professionals to offer their services for nothing and to do it for on behalf of someone else on behalf of people who haven't got the money to pay for the professional service while they might need it it's very very well established in the legal profession and it's also as you can see by the little picture um, it's good for you so it's a two-way thing it's good for society in general but it's very good for you and i'm going to show you how you can make it work for you as well in professional terms. Oops. Now, I'm an English native speaker. I was born and brought up in this country. And as someone who has a total of actually five other languages, I'm really, really unusual. So many people who are born and raised in this country have one language. And sadly, so many people who come from other backgrounds, from other countries, and arrive here, perhaps having one or two languages with them, they very quickly lose the birth language. I'm very fortunate. I have um, my daughter-in-law is from Slovakia, and she has conscientiously and a great personal effort brought her sons up to be bilingual. And they are fantastic. They're only, the oldest one is only five. And they are perfectly bilingual and can hold conversations in Slovak with anybody. But the interesting thing is, and this is in the advantages of being bilingual, and if you are bilingual, hats off, keep it up. And if you're having children, then raise them bilingual. My grandson, who is Slovak English speaker, can now also speak, he can, well, he can count to 20 in French and Spanish as well. And you can see, for him, it's no obstacle Oh, yes, well, this is another way of doing it. This is another way of speaking. Oh, I can do that. And start, so off he goes. Because he's already got that double brain thing. And it's really beneficial. Apparently, it staves off Alzheimer's as well. So I'm hopeful. Um, so we all do it. If you're, if you're multilingual, if you've got more than one language, then people will ask you to do things. Oh, you speak foreign languages. What does this say? Letters, emails, holiday bookings, helping people out if they've had an accident abroad, all those kind of things. We do it for nothing out of goodwill. But when you're working pro bono, you're working for charities, um, NGOs, for people who are in trouble, and you're a volunteer. And volunteer, the English word volunteer means somebody who does something willingly, from the, out, out of their own will. They choose to do it. They don't have to do it. They choose to do it willingly. I belong to an international organisation. I'm a member of that international organisation. I work for the group in my own town, but it's a global organisation. And one of its mantras is, nothing but the best is good enough for the poor. When people are in dire need, like the people who are trying to cross the Mediterranean at the moment in, in boats and dying on the way, when they're in dire need, they've left everything behind, they've got nothing, don't take away their sense of dignity, don't take away their self-esteem, give, give them the best that you can do for them, because they are worth it, as the tagline goes. So volunteers are professionals we give of our professional, we give our professional expertise, expertise to for free, just as if we were being paid for it. And the more we put in, the more we will get out. And I can speak from experience. I've done pro bono translating all my working life, and I have got more out of that almost than out of my professional career in all kinds of ways. So if you're going to do this, you're going to set out on the freelance life. It's really hard work. The bare necessities are long hours and working really hard, giving of your best. But when you're working pro bono or in any other, in other way, you learn on the job, so everything you do, treat it as a learning experience. And in the <coughs> voluntary sector, you will meet some fabulous people. We hear all the bad news in the, in the news, we hear all the horror stories, but when you go into, when you start looking around you and seeing that the good that people do, and how really generous and good and kind-hearted most of us are, and I'm talking to a room full of generous, kind-hearted people. We really are. We, you know, none of us set out to be horrible at the, in the first thing in the morning. I mean, you might feel like it's some first thing in the morning, but you don't, generally speaking. And you really meet some lovely people, not only your colleagues, the people you're working with, but also the, the recipients. There are some... And people who have been through hell and back, they are wonderful people. 
They are people with dignity and courage. I have met some courageous people in my life, people I am in awe of. And they're not people with pots of money and fancy cars or anything like that. They're people with absolutely nothing, but they are the most courageous, lovely people I have had the privilege to work for. A bit of my experience with this organisation I work for, um, there's a project between Canada and the Dominican Republic where students in Canada, school children in Canada, they provide um, education resources for children in the Dominican Republic. So they're twinned with a school in the Dominican Republic and they pack up, every now and again, they'll pack up a box of pencils and colouring things and paper and all the kinds of things that children in, you know, in, in, in rich countries take for granted in their everyday school life, but they don't in, in countries which don't have those resources. And they send them out, but there's a two-way process because they, they can talk to the school they're twinned with, they Skype them, they email them, they send them examples of each other's work and so on. So it's a very, very you know, beneficial process on both sides. And the children in Canada learn a great deal out for, for it about what it's like for kids in other countries. And similarly, <coughs> this organisation I work for has a lot to do with the Syrian refugees who are going into Lebanon, where French is one of the, the, the main languages of communication internationally. And I do a great deal of work, and I'm in touch with individuals on the ground in Syria and in the Lebanon who are living in that situation, the terrible situation they have at the moment. <coughs> so from the inside, I have some knowledge of it, and I really value that. I think it's a tremendous asset for me, because when you hear about it on the news, it's, it's what's happening over there, but I know the names of some of the people who are going through that. And I know their stories. I mean, a bit like Rose was saying about, you know, translating somebody's personal correspondence. I've got that personal knowledge of what's there. And that is really, really privileged situation to be in. And I appreciate it. I do a great deal of that all the time. Um, every, every week I'm doing something like that. So that's fantastic. I love it. Um, <clears throat> where to find this kind of work? Um, obviously, word of mouth. We've already heard about one of the most important things when you're starting out is to tell everybody what you're doing. Don't keep it to yourself that you want to be a freelance professional translator or interpreter. Tell everybody, anyone you meet, talk to them about it. Get boring about it. Because one of those people will say, oh, actually, now, where did I hear that? Oh, yeah, I'll send you the email, I'll send you the link. I saw something about that. Also, get your stuff out there on social media, LinkedIn, all those kind of things. I'm sure you all do that already. But tell people what you're hoping to do. Directly contact aid organisations and NGOs. They've all got websites and most of them the big ones have got a volunteer tab you can look at that you can see what kinds of things they're looking for what languages they want what areas of expertise and you can get yourself onto databases and then where where are you where do you live what's in your immediate vicinity in this country and lots of other countries we have twin town organizations and all of those local groups are always delighted to find someone who will come forward and say oh well you know if you're inviting a group from germany or you know, Denmark or whoever it is, to come and visit your... I'm, I, that's my language. I'm happy to help with some interpreting. They'll, be, they'll welcome you with open arms. Same sort of thing with sports clubs, uniformed organisations. Look at your own abilities. What, what am I interested in? I'm a, am I a musician? Uh, you know, do I play a sport? What does my club do? Has my club got, a, you know, is touring abroad at the moment? My, my choir is going to visit another country. Offer your services because it's... You're giving something really helpful, you're doing something really helpful, but you can then take the golden nugget from that, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And translation companies, lots of translation companies, either offer pro bono as part of their social package or will help you to find uh, pro bono work. So again, quite a few companies have that as an option. So they'll take you on as a fledgling translator, but they might give you some pro bono work to do to start with to get you started and see what the quality of your work is like. So you have the advantage of working for a translation company who will check your work. They won't pay you, but they're giving you that professional experience to get you in. So that, that can be a really advantage. So look for that when you're, when you're online. You've already heard about these, and I know you know all about these. Um, internships with translation companies and international aid organisations, whether as translators and interpreters or in another capacity using your languages. Always check them out. Don't work for something that you're, you're not comfortable with. The National Network for, Lang for Translation, Roots into Languages, European Graduate Placement Schemes, all those are there. Huge competition for those places, but they can be very, very useful. 
and you can learn a lot. But you need to check them out and find out exactly what they're asking you to do. Whether you're paid, whether you get some expenses, those kind of things. You need to make sure you know what you're getting into. So do your research before you start looking at those. Translators Without Borders is a fabulous organisation. Really, really good. They do require people with experience. You can't just volunteer and they'll take you on. They are very, very professional. So they're looking for people with two or three years' experience. But have a look at their website. They've got an application form um, and see what you can offer them. But they are, really, they, they are unparalleled in the service they offer. Uh, and they fit it to where they are. So they'll be doing one thing um, in, you know, where in Nepal where the, the earthquake has, has recently happened and another thing where there's a war situation going on or something like that. They tailor the, their services to suit the situation they're in. Very, very good. And again, I already mentioned the language show, networking, get to know people, join your professional organisations, join ITI, please, they're wonderful. And ITI have really good um, offer, a, a really good package, a really good offering for pe new people. I work on the um, starting out as a translator and interpreter, um, similar to this, but an online webinar-based um, course, um, which is, is, you know, I'm just one of a number of people who teach on that, and it's really useful again. And, and with the mentoring, there are various mentoring schemes ITI offers as well, according to language networks. And then there's um, the ITI networks themselves. You can join those, and you'll often find one-off jobs there. That, I mean, even just thinking about the ones I've looked at this week, Oh, somebody who needs a certificate translating, somebody who's got you know, sh a short job that needs placing and I haven't got time to do it, anybody interested, here's the contact, or unusual language combinations. There was one for Italian into French this week on the Italian network. So somebody who's got that combination uh, that's a bit more unusual. Um, so you, if you join those, you'll often find opportunities that you might be the right person to hit the spot and get your first customer that way. And that obviously would be paid, or nine times out of ten would be paid, wouldn't necessarily be pro bono. But all these things are really good ways to get yourself in there and get yourself started. <coughs> what am I doing? So my first job, this is a real customer. Even if they're not paying you, they're a real customer. So do your level best to be professional. When you get the material, whether it's um, you know, documents or whatever it is, treat it with respect. It's confidential. Um, it, you know, it's not your material, it belongs to somebody else. And do the best job you can on behalf of the people you're working for and for yourself. As a translator, you produce the document in the format or style that the customer wants. Check it and check it and check it again. Make sure you haven't made any mistakes. It's really beautifully done, beautifully presented. Get a second pair of eyes to read it through if you can. Another native speaker, not necessarily with the source language, but with the native language, get somebody who knows what they're doing to check it through for any obvious glaring errors. Deliver on time. Like I said, don't give your customer a problem. Always be on time. Solve their problem for, for you. And then ask for feedback. And that is one of the most valuable things you'll get out of this. They're not paying you, but say, was it okay? What did it look? Produce a basic list of questions. Say, could you just answer these questions for me? You know, did I do the kind of job you wanted? Was it satisfactory? Is the customer, is the end user of the document satisfied? Has it been helpful? Those kind of things. Get that feedback because you can build on that. And if they say, well, actually, you know, what we really wanted was X, Y, Z, next time you can put it right and you can do something better. Same with, with interpreting. Be on time, be smart, be well prepared for your assignment. Ask for help. Don't hesitate to ask for help in this situation. If you're working for nothing, that's what they'll give you. Go the extra mile if you can. If they wanted you for an hour and they need you for two, then stay if you can. But say so if you can't beforehand. Say when you have to leave. And then again, ask for feedback. Was it good? And afterwards, you review what you did. You go through it all again. The subject area, the type of document and assignment, how, how did it work, what went wrong, but what worked. And then keep looking for more customers and everything, every single word you translate, every single um, assignment you go to as an interpreter, write it down, record it. Keep a record from day one of every single thing you've ever done, whether or not you've been paid, because all of that is your personal experience. That's your portfolio. That's your record of your personal achievement. And therefore, when it comes to applying for membership of professional organisations, for instance, ITI asks for proven evidence of experience. And whether or not you've been paid, it's still experience. And if, as long as you can prove it, then it's, it counts towards your membership of ITI in the future. 
There are pitfalls. So those are two possible if you're working for charities. You can check out on various websites. Intelligentgiving.com is like American-based, so it's more global. Charities Commission in this country. You might find you, you might be asked to do something free for, for an organisation. When you look them up, you're actually not keen on them. You're not keen on their politics or the kinds of things that they're, they're, the way that places their money goes. But you can check it out and be sure if you don't know them in advance. So make sure you know what you're getting into. And then the benefits gives you experience, of course. Um, it gives you experience in applying for jobs and presenting yourself. You've got something to offer. It gives you expertise. As I said before, I started out as an, uh, translating engineering, electronics, things like that. But over the years, one of the things pro bono has done for me is moved me into other areas of specialism. So now, among other things, I do civil society, um, gender issues, um, human rights, those kind of things, because I've come to that through pro bono. So I can now offer those to organisations that will pay me. So it's a new area of expertise. Similarly, if you're doing something with a, a sports club or with a music group or something like that, that could be another area of expertise for you in future. You know, sports, sports related things, music, or anything like that. So new areas of specialisation with people who are willing to support you because you're doing something for them for free and they're willing to give you the extra help that you might need with it. It's very rewarding, as I said. You get a tremendous amount of sense of, you know, I've given something back and it's a sense of achievement for yourself. You learn a lot, and it also gives you references. Because again, that's one of the really valuable things. You've, you've done a job for someone for nothing, they're pleased with it, and you say, can I use your name as a reference? So when you're asked for a reference, you've got one. And if it's a decent size, well-known charity, for instance, then it's really valuable. It's well worth having. And that can be your key into paid work. So maximize your investment. You've put something into this, act as if you're being paid, Treat your customer as if they're a business customer. Always record it. Record everything you've, you've done for it. Word count, subject, deadlines. Make sure you know what you're doing. Keep your glossaries. If you've learnt new vocabulary, keep that new vocabulary because it will be something to build on for another job in that area. Meet your deadline. Do your research. Ask for feedback and get your reference. That's your gold star at the end of the day, is your, is your feedback and your reference. Abs invaluable, especially when you're starting out. So there's a little task for you to get started. If you haven't had any work as a translator, or not much, make a list of all your potential contacts, local people, you know, friends and family. You know, if your second cousin once removed works for a government organisation, he's a possible contact, somebody you can go to and say, does your organisation ever need translators? That's what happened to me. I started out working for a government organisation that a neighbour of ours worked for. And he said, oh, they've got a translation department up the corridor from me. Um, I'll give you the name of the person who runs it. And that was it. I took off then. That was my first really proper, really big job. Talk about what you do. Tell everybody. Decide on what your interests are and your geographical area. Tailor your CV for every customer. So you're applying to a new customer. Pick out, oh, I did that job for that one. That's their area. I'll use that as my heading, my main subject, the thing I've done. Investigate your markets, look things up, and then join any networks and professional groups. We are a wonderful <laughs> profession. We build bridges. We put people in touch with each other who they could never talk to without us. We enable communication, and we are peacemakers because we are one of the, we are one of the invisible threads in peacemaking around the world. Because you, in a, if you can't talk to somebody, you don't understand them, you'll never get on with them. And we help people get on and understand each other. You are starting out on the best job in the world. And I really hope that you all make a go of it. And I really congratulate you on your abilities and having chose it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Joanna. Um, could I now ask our speakers to come and sit and face everyone again? Um, we've now got a, a question and answer session. Um, have we got our microphones? Yes. So if you have a question, um, please could you put your hand up and then when I point to you, wait until one of our student helpers in the green t-shirts um, give you the microphone so that everyone can hear your question. Um, also, if um, your question is addressed to one of the speakers in particular, if you could say so, um, um, or maybe say whether it's to do with translation or interpreting. 
Could we have so. the, the projector light turned off? Oh, it's yes. Mm. yes. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise they'll be blinded. Um, right, so, over to you. You're <laughs> stunned no, with all this Thank information. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 There's one over there. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, all four of you, for your speeches this morning. Uh, this one's particularly directed to Rick. Um, I was just wondering, in trans creation, or if you're part of an ad campaign, but both or multiple languages are actually going to be on the cup, on the ad, how does that affect the process? I mean, in terms of aligning it? I mean. Yeah, like I'm thinking of McDonald's. I'm loving it for a while. Ah, all of the languages yeah. are on the cup at the same time. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it, it certainly exacerbates things. Um, it, it's far more involved than, you know, if, for instance, um, I mean, the, the McDonald's example is a particularly complicated one because you've got at least 15 to 20 languages, I think, on one cup. Um, but the process would be the same whether you had three or whether you had 30. Um, what you would look for, we have a, a creative team within World Writers, so they help look at the collateral when it comes back. So let's say, for example, that I've got six languages. Um, I've got French, French Italian, German, uh, Spanish, Japanese, and simplified Chinese. Yeah, and they all need to have an alignment on a tagline. So once that's briefed up to the copywriters, of course, they produce their transcreations with back translations and rationales. But when that comes back, we actually screen everything. So we're, we're looking at the, all these things side by side with the reasoning, with all the rationale to decide whether they're actually on brand. Because if you have six, which are nice, or five which are nice and short, and then one, probably the German or the Russian, which is <laughs> 20 words, um, it's not going to work. It's not going to look good. So this is where we kind of like step in and have like a, a dedicated QC process. Because otherwise, you're exactly right. You could go out to, you know, if you go out to 20 different translators, you will get 20 bits of copy which are not necessarily going to be unified. So that kind of unification is part of what we do. And again, it's part of why we you know, present a centralized model for language adaptation for our clients. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Right at the top there. Thank you. Um, Dennis Aker, um, I'm a freelance translator from English into Turkish. Um, I have two uh, questions uh, uh, to two uh, uh, of the panelists. Uh, first, uh, to Sarah. Um, uh, we need to have a client base, but um, I believe uh, having a client base that is made up of direct clients would be much more lucrative uh, for most of us. Um, uh, is there a magical way to approach direct clients? <laughs> Perhaps I need to know that. Um, uh, the second question would be to Joanna. Um, uh, pro bono work, it's great, but um, I wonder if it can be used as a marketing strategy to uh, get our names heard. Yeah, yeah, that's an easy question to answer, yes. Anything like that because it's all experience so as I said before you can use if so how can how can we do that how can we include that kind of a marketing strategy in our translation business plan well I th I think you, I should let Sarah answer her first <laughs> but I think you could uh, if you were, it's all part of your personal experience so if you say uh, you need to be a bit careful approaching customers you want money from to say well I will work for free but the experience you gain and you, is well worth adding to your freelance profile or your web page or so on. You can, you can have it on your web page, you can include links, um, you can use it for s as samples of work as long as the material's anonymized or not confidential. So all those kind of things, it can be built in to the process. And Sarah? Yeah, and the direct the clients question, yes, direct clients are better. They tend to work better with you. They tend to deal with you personally better. And they tend to pay better because the you know, translation rates, people will pay an agency and they will come to you and pay you the same as they would pay the agency, but of course there's no agency to take the agency cut, and agencies have to make a living, they do all their own marketing, but they have a reason. Yeah. So yes, it's better. How you find those, it depends on your personal situation, on your personal contacts, and your personal specialist knowledge. So you need to make yourself a specialist in the area you want to find your clients in. You don't go to um, translation events on that. You go to client events on the topic that you're interested in. You don't go up and say, I'm a translator, give me a job. You go up and you say, oh, I've heard your company is developing into this market. You show that you're a specialist. And then, incidentally, you mention that you're a translator later on, by which time they're very keen on you and they 
you know, they know that you're interested in their business. It, you have to really go about marketing yourself and knowing your area. And you know, it's no good going looking for clients when you don't know anything about what they're doing. So it, it's hard graft. But it's worth considering that the cost that you will pay to go to these events is tax deductible. You can enter it into your accounts. And you, know, you, you have to take your strategy from where you are. Uh, on our course at, at Portsmouth, we, we do an exercise with the entrepreneur, entrepreneurship person in the business school. And he gets people to sit down and say, I'm here. Who do I know? What do I know about? And you build your circle out from where you are at. And, and that's what you do. You go and you market. Now, I know people who've, one person started out, um, trucks would come over from Europe looking for broccoli. She was in Lincolnshire. She went out with people, looked at broccoli, talked about broccoli in different languages. Now she, her field of expertise is international logistics of moving all sorts of products all over the world because she built up on that. So it's finding you know, the oddest thing, but it's a start and building out from it. So, if I, I hope can, that helps. <laughs> yeah, also add that um, in my career, I've had direct clients, and yes, it is much better. Mm. You can build up a relationship. Mm. You can talk directly to the people who've written the documents mm. that you're translating, often to explain, uh, and sometimes even uh, point out mistakes. Uh, and then they're very, very grateful to you, because obviously you're analysing their text very carefully. Um, but also, as a freelance with direct um, clients, you are their one source of translation, so you have to be in a position to meet their demands. Mm. And that can be quite difficult to juggle if you're, dealing, uh, if you're working for other people as well. So bear that in mind, and, and I would say gauge what their work workload is going to be exactly. and see whether you can, yeah, can and cope build, with it reliably. Exactly. And build yourself a professional network of people who you trust whose work you trust, who when a big project comes in and they say we've got this massive amount, you can contact these people too and they can be your team. You know, we need to think like that as well and work collaboratively together. Can I, can I speak up for translation companies, just quickly? Yeah. I know it's not popular, but I, I have got, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many translation companies I work for regularly, maybe 10 or a dozen I work for regularly. Um, and I mix, I have a mix of direct mm. and, and translation companies. I love translation companies. If you find a good one mm. and you can build, you can do the same thing. You can build a relationship with them. But what they do is they do half the work for mm. you. They don't, you don't have to market yourself. Once you're there, they will send you everything they've got. As I said, if you're reliable mm. and trustworthy and on time, you can st stagger your work with them. They don't mind if you tell them you're taking a week off work. And also they do, a, they do another level. They'll do another level of checking so, depending on your customer, as long as you make it clear, um, say, you know, how your work is going to be revised, if you're happy with it, then you send them the work and you might never see it again because it goes to them, they check it and send it to the customer, that's the end of it. If you're working for direct clients, you really have to find someone who you can work with who will check your work because we should have our work read at least once through with a second pair of eyes. So, you have to pay somebody to do that. And maybe you have to do it for somebody else as a sort of mutual thing. But so that is a component to take into account with this extra money you're earning for direct clients, the cost of your own marketing and the cost of your, your checking and revising. So that it is, as Sarah said, it's mm. a balance. Mm. And it can be good to have a mix of the two. Mm. So I, I speak up for translation companies. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK. Uh, yes, yeah, this one over, Phoebe, behind you. Hi, thank you very much for everything you've done so far with the presentations. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of interpreting, do you think to stand out in interpreting it's worth taking some time to do an intensive course in a language that is less common, such as Arabic or Chinese, so that you can really sort of have a head start almost in applying for things? Is this a question for me? Yes. Um, I would hesitate to recommend it as such because I think from experience learning a language involves living in that country for a certain amount of time. If you have the time to do that, absolutely. But you have to bear in mind in public service interpreting, unlike simultaneous conference interpreting, you're working in both languages. So you've got to be as proficient into the other language, not your mother tongue. I mean, you can never reach mother tongue level unless you're bilingual. But 
you have to be very proficient, very able to explain quite complex concepts in English into another language which may not have those concepts and therefore you're going to have to use long paraphrases. And I think to have that linguistic juggling ability in another language does involve quite intensive study of it. And I would certainly recommend living in the country. I've lived in Italy for six years. I've lived in France for four years. And those are my two working languages. Um, so yes, definitely. I think it does give you an edge in terms of the marketplace, as has been mentioned by other colleagues. The very common Western European languages get paid less well because there are the market forces are such. There are more people offering them. But as soon as you go into the realm of something a little bit more offbeat, um, you will command a higher price for your services. But make sure you have the time to go and, and live abroad, if possible, in that country to really get the language under your belt to that level. Thank you. I think, was there, um, uh, Phoebe behind you, was, actually, I think was first. Thank you. Um, I teach um, translation at the University of Surrey. And um, one of the things I find very difficult to do is to advise students when they leave us about filling in application forms on translation company websites when it asks for specialisations. Um, because obviously they might have done a, a module in law translation or economics or science or anything mm. like that, but then they're not really what you would call a professional scientific translator or a technical translator or whatever. So um, we have talked about doing pro bono work and actually trying to focus on specific areas mm so that you actually gain a specific um, specialisation in that way. Um, but do you have any other suggestions about how mm. to deal with that? Um, I know it's a, big, it's a difficult mm. question, but um, I just wondered if you had any ideas. I always say to our students, especially if they've come straight from a languages degree to an MA, I say getting your MA is your driving licence for translation. It tell, you know how, but you don't know the what yet. And I would really firmly recommend going to your other country and working there in a field. Mm. Uh, and then you have the specialism. Uh, it, it's, it's very difficult. If you haven't had a previous work life in another language, you won't have the professional level of knowledge and language capacity because you just haven't had the chance. Mm. So you know, I would really recommend going off and, and working yeah, for so real. That, it, that kind of precludes them going and applying straight away then for translation companies with those, with those fixed forms where you have to um, say at the outset what your specialisations are. There's nothing wrong with filling them in, but the chances of getting work aren't mm. great if you've mm. got no mm -hmm. content. You know? it's, mm. it's, Thank it's, you. it's a toughie. Thanks. I mean, I mean one, thing, one thing I would add to that is... Um, Certainly we see this, I mean, uh, I worked at a translation agency many years before as well as you know, the agency now. Um, <clears throat> and obviously if you, if you don't have a specialization, obviously you can't lie and pretend that you do in the mm. hope that you can wing it and, and manage to you know, deliver a pattern on time. Um, but you know, if you are honest and you say that you know, mm. I'm a generalist, you know, I have mm. general kind of translation expertise, then by and large, you know, the, the translation agency, translation agencies, they will use you because mm. they, they, you know, yes, there is a lot of scientific kind of like med, sci, and pharma and all those kind of things that do require people who have you know their work experience, like mm. you know, like Jane said. But as Sarah said, but um, you know, if you put that you're a generalist and you, you know you're going to try your hand at anything. Mm. Chances are they'll give you that kind of work. Chances are you might find you know a niche that you never knew existed within you. Mm -hmm. um, so you know if if you if, if leave, living abroad, going and living in another country and developing you know a specialism isn't something that's feasible because let's mm -hmm. face it, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, then I would say there's still some hope. I mean you can start you can apply and you can say I'm a general translator. Please give me anything because a lot of clients with their marketing activities are going to have requirements for a generalist translator mm -hmm. rather than the you know the heavy duty stuff of specialisms. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just think it's a shame if they're missing out on really good quality translators just because they don't have the specialisms mm. to yeah, start yeah. with. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. All right, Phoebe, I think there was one just oh, here in, in front of you. Yeah, and this then lady here. Two down here, sorry. Hi, it's to um, Joanna Waller. Um, it was just about um, the pro bono translation experience. If you haven't got professional experience yet, would you write on your CV that you'd done it pre bono, or would you just put it down as work experience? Um, you can, yeah, you can say it's pro bono. You can say you've worked, you know, you gained experience working with X charity, this or this community group, or whatever it is. Yeah, I don't see there's any harm in, in saying it's pro bono. That's 
that shows a positive attitude on your part to trying to find experience one way or another, you know, that, that you would, just as if you were applying for any other job, you might say, well, I've, you know, I'm straight out of school, but I've worked in, you know, as a volunteer in a charity shop or something like that, you know, it all counts. Um, so, yeah, there's no reason why you shouldn't say it's pro bono. You just make it clear that you do want money for the work you do. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it's preferable to actually say it, or is it better just to... Leave um, it blank and let them ask you I think, the well, I think it's always preferable to, be, preferable to be honest, put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, there was another one over that side. Is this lady here has had her arm. Oh, she sorry. Was getting right. aching. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a languages teacher, um, but also a trainee dance movement psychotherapist. Um, and I'm very interested in the intersubjectivity effect of language. And language is not neutral, as I guess probably everybody, perhaps we all take for granted, perhaps as, as workers and as people who are employed in languages. Um, I think my question is to all of you, but perhaps particularly to Rose, when you've spent a day being somebody else and use it and use it speaking in the first person, and if they need to say fuck off to the person, then you're reiterating that, for example. What are the effects? Could you say something about the effects of that experience of being? Of the, inter of the subjective effect of other people's language, be that in simultaneous interpreting or perhaps more indirectly in uh, translation? Well, as I said, you have to be honest. You have to say it as it's said. You can't be shy to say fuck off if that's what's being said and you're doing a disservice to the people you're working for if you do. So having said that, uh, I also mentioned that you might not like the people you're working for. You might think they're lying through their teeth. You might think they're very unpleasant. You might not, you know, they may be a rapist or a suspected rapist. They may be a murderer. So I guess once, if you do know a little bit about a job in advance and you think that might make you uncomfortable, then you should turn it down. I'm glad to say so far I haven't had any jobs where I've felt so uncomfortable that I've really not wanted to be there. But you sort of dissociate yourself. It's not you at the end of the day. It's the person. And all you're doing is being their voice piece, if you like. You are speaking with a voice for them, but it's not you. And as much as you are personifying them through the voice, it, you don't have to take on all that that in involves. You don't have to become the person mm. as such. You're, you're just speaking because they can't speak in that language. So it can be, it can be very tiring. Um, and you have to scrape the bottom of your linguistic barrel to find different ways of saying things. You might sort of run out. Sometimes we have three ways of saying things in English and you've only got two in your other languages and so you're struggling to find a way of putting things in another language. But um, does that sort of answer what you're saying? Yes? No? <laughs> Should no. we take that as a yes, yes. then? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll come back to you if I need to. I'll come to you. I'll speak to you personally. If I, if perhaps I, later. I, would, I would say that there's a kind of like importance in, in kind of finding a degree of neutrality within mm. oneself, you know, the ability to judge situations dispassionately and kind of disconnect yourselves in a way um, with content that you might find a bit more, you know, tricky or something that you would not personally choose to adapt if you, if, you know, if you were not doing it yourself. Um, and that kind of, you know, neutrality will help you in all the fields that you work within. Um, you will be required to translate things that are not your bag. Um, and it may go you know, to extremes of that as well, like, uh, like was mentioned. Yeah, and in translation, it tends to be less of an issue because mm. it's only when you're doing something literary or something very personal where there's an author whose voice needs to be heard that you need to sort of put them, yourself in their position. You know, most of the stuff I do, I know the genre, I know what the readership will expect, and I make the message clear so that the readership will receive it at the right sort of professional tone and level. And so the author voice isn't so important. But if you're doing literature or poetry, then the author voice can be, you've got to be a, a lot more involved in you know, getting to know and express the feeling. And translation is always a sort of shadowy thing. You can only put across some of the meaning. So you have to prioritize. And you know, it, it's immensely variable. <laughs> OK, I think there was one. Oh, there's hands everywhere now. Um, one, yes, right next to you, and then we'll come over to here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm currently a postgrad doing MA uh, in translation studies, and uh, about to uh, start my career. So I really uh, focus on the internship thing, and I noticed that I want to raise a question to Sarah. And you have you have um, you have said about the project management trap. Could you please make 
go further detail. And also my second question goes to Rick. Uh, I noticed that this trans uh, cre creation industry is pretty much like a combination between uh, localization and advertising, is that right? And. Uh, Okay. Should we deal with them one at a time, yeah. I think? First well, of all, with yeah. Sarah. The, the project management thing is we, we've had students who've gone on internships and, and they've been... The, the job as a project manager, yes, you know about the translation world, but you don't get translation experience necessarily. You will learn an awful lot about how the, how the, the contracts work, how the systems work, how the procedures work, how the quality control is put in. You'll learn an awful lot but you won't necessarily get translation experience. And we've had some students come back from internships and they said, well, I didn't get to do any translating. So you've got to be aware of what you can possibly get out of a situation and what you won't. And it'll depend on so many variables that you can't predict what you'll get from the uh, position. But you know, some people have sort of, some people have gone into teaching and then said, well, I didn't get what I wanted out of it. Or you know, it's just be aware of what you're likely to get. And if you want to do translation, then make sure that you get to translation, really. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, and Rick, if, yep. if you... Um, yeah. So transcreation and the, the application of it are kind of directly or indirectly linked to the legacy of advertising. If you think, you know, 20 years back, or if any of you have seen Mad Men, um, then it focuses very much on traditional forms of media. So um, press ads, you know, TV commercials back when they were first starting. Um, and that's where the transcreation world kind of uh, emerged from in a way. But now things have changed because companies and brands are realizing that it's not only their traditional media formats, which are destined for transcreation, which are very important, need to have a message translated in the right way, but also their secondary kind of advertising. So their websites, their UI, you know, everything that builds, you know, if you think of Apple, for example, you know, everything that they do is, is, is typified by the personality they bring to the table. So by logical extension, any language work that is required would therefore benefit generally speaking, from transcreation. Sure, I'm not going to recommend transcreating Apple's terms and conditions on iTunes because no one's going to read them, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's the right, the right time and the right place. And the, lo the world of localization, and I'm talking about software localization, website localization, mm -hmm. and the world of transcreation do merge. You know, if, if I could draw a Venn diagram, then there would be a, a significant overlap between the two. Um, but ultimately, it depends on the client. It depends on what material they have and whether they believe it's necessary to do uh, one uh, workflow over the other. If you spend a lot of time talking with people in procurement, as I have, um, then they, over the past 20 years, have driven down you know, further and further the cost of translation. And it's only now when, you know, if, if, if you get very, very cheap translation, then obviously quality is not necessarily a guarantee. So now they're coming full circle and realizing that they may require a more high quality output, whether that's a translator or whether that's you know, a copywriter, that's neither here nor there. But they're starting to realize that. So the, the bigger brands in the world are starting to utilize transcreation as a much more valid option for anything that's related to their marketing activities. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thank so, you. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, just one minute. Um, so what kind of person are you looking for? Uh, what kind of quality does a candidate in your industry should be, um, have, should have? Um, they should possess the ability of linguistic alchemy. Mm -hmm. The finest <laughs> definition that I, can, <laughs> that I can give you there. Um, Obviously, it needs to be someone who's you know, very calm under pressure. Um, they need to be heavily invested in not only the target language, but also the source language. You know, um, if we talk about advertising in general, for the examples that I showed you, it's idiom rich. You know, for, for better or for worse, English is the, is the, the global language. Um, and until something significant uh, happens, I, I doubt that's going to change. So your marketing agencies in the UK and the US, because let's face it, that's where the vast majority of them are, they're going to develop very UK-centric and, and American-centric campaigns. Um, with a lot of idiom and nuances which work within their market because they don't think globally. They don't have the, the, the depth and breadth of experience that everybody in this room does. Um, so they will simply think that their line is going to work and they don't necessarily consider the next step in the, in the chain, which is kind of where we come in and we, we get thrown curveballs and they say, we've got this advertising line that no one understands outside of America, but we need to go and transcreate it and make it work. So then you need to kind of reverse engineer it and transmute it into something else that works. So that's the, the key kind of thing, I suppose, is this kind of flexibility, linguistic flexibility, as well as a deep-seated understanding of culture and nuance to be able to interpret that idiom and make it work. Um, you've got to be quick. You've got to have a set, you know, your, your own kind of like sense of wit to be able to pull out a witty catchphrase and be able to, to render it on paper, knowing that you know, 20,000 people in, in X country, they're going to see that on a big billboard outside. Um, so th th those are the kind of the credentials that we would look for um, in someone in, in becoming a copywriter or being part of the transcreation industry. Okay, I think uh, there's one down here. Hi, 
Thank you. Um, I'm a career changer. I'm bilingual, um, but I have ne I hold two degrees, neither of which I hold um, a BD and an MA, neither of which in, in languages. So I, when I pursue this career choice, I would be committed to undertaking uh, further qualification, clearly. Uh, but for a number of reasons, the MA, for example, doesn't seem to be the path for me. In which case, from my research so far, I understand that the dip trance would possibly be the way in for me from the perspective of professional qualifications. I guess I'm keen to understand um, whether or not, in your respective perspectives, either qualification is as highly regarded by the industry or whether there is a preference. Thank you. Um, in my experience, people want something to prove that you're at a professional level and they're not worried if it's a dip trans or an MA. They want to know that you have applied yourself, you have studied and you have a professional outlook and attitude. If you happen to have worked for 20 years in the automotive industry and you already know all about it, you don't need anything. Because, you know, the, your, your, what you present is the proof of the pudding. You know, they, they know that you're really, really good. So it's, you know, whatever is most suitable to you. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah. Joanna, do you have anything to add? No, not really. I'd agree. I mean, yeah. I, when I was starting out, there was no such thing really as an MA in translating anyway. Mm -hmm. So I came in with a degree, an ordinary BA in languages, yeah. and uh -huh. built up from there. I, I think it is, it's your professional approach to it and what you mm -hmm. can give. Mm -hmm. But it's by all means, if you, you know, do the dip trans is, is practical. MA perhaps is a bit broader, but that's. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. And there's a, an immense variety. I mean, I've been associated with three different MA courses and each one has strengths and weaknesses. So if, if you were going to commit, I would recommend reading in detail what you get on each course because they vary immensely. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there and there, I think that will have to be it for this session. Oh, sorry, the lady over there, you did put your hand up earlier mm -hmm. as well. So if we... Yeah. Try and three brief questions. Okay, uh, this one is for Rick. I have the questions. Uh, for Rick, um, is uh, to be a trans creator, is there uh, any other requirement like a degree in marketing or any other else to be hired as it? And uh, for any of the panelists, uh, I've seen those translations that go simultaneously, like the, uh, the uh, interpreter is like thinking with the head of the conferences. This, is that something to be uh, with someone really skilled or it is something that you can learn to do? <laughs> right, so I think Rick first. Um, to borrow another advertising line, every little helps. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, 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 some of our copywriters, for instance, you know, we have over 3,500 globally, um, and they come from all different walks of life. Um, some have been translators for 20 years, some have been specialised in proofreading, some specialise in legal, med sci, pharma, um, automotive, you know, absolutely anything you can imagine, children's toys, for example, um, because we you know, need to be able to pick and choose the right talent for the right job. Just because you're a very skilled copywriter at writing material for... Um, tech doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be very good at writing slogans for you know children's toys. Um, it would be you know kind of improbable to think that you'd be equally skilled in both. So you know you, 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 we develop these skills and we pick the right people for the job. Some of the, the freelancers have um, been creative directors at their own firms in their own countries for 20, 30 years and decided you know what freelancers' life is much easier for me. I'd rather work at home. And then of course they still have the commitment to you know, interesting kind of language adaptation, and that's how they get involved. Some have worked in advertising, some have worked in marketing. Um, they really do come from all walks of life. Um, and just, and, and again, just because someone has got a degree in advertising or marketing, or even a degree in, you know, on, oncology, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not good at creative adaptations. They might find that they're actually very good at it. Um, they simply never did it before. Um, we have, you know, uh, tests for all of our copywriters who apply, um, where we would give them lines like, just do it, for example, and say, do your worst, you know, show us what you can do. And then we can sense, we've, we've done, done this for over you know, 20, 30 years, we can see you know, where their strengths lie, where their weaknesses lie, because then we know we've got someone on board who is good at a particular type of work versus someone else who we use, we'd reserve for a tech job or a, you know, a science kind of based job. So it really depends. I wouldn't say that there's any um, kind of dead cert way to, to get in there. Um, it's really if you've got the passion for it. You know, that, that's probably the most important thing, I'd say. I'm not sure, with your second question, um, could you repeat it? 
Sure, it is uh, related the simultaneous translation. Uh, I wonder if there are some uh, skills that uh, we are able to learn to do that, or it is it is just a gifting that you are gifted to do that, and you can almost guess what the the people is going to say. I think it's probably important to separate PSI interpreting, which I do mostly, and cherry on the cake stuff, which is simultaneous interpreting in a conference situation, in a booth with headphones, which I do very little of. They are two very different things. Mostly simultaneous interpreting, conference, EU, UN, and all those sort of international bodies. You pretty well always working into your mother tongue. So you're going one direction, but from a number of foreign languages generally. So you may be doing from French into English, German into English, Italian into English, etc. And that's something you learn to do. It's very specialized. It's very uh, tough on your brain. You can only really do it for 20 minutes, half an hour at a time, and then you hand over to your partner. So you're working in pairs. Whereas what I was talking about, public service interpreting, is working on your own, but going both ways, using your languages pretty well equally, actually, because I work equally into my foreign languages for the client I'm working for and into English for his or her interlocutors. So they're two fairly different skills. They both need a lot, a lot of practice. I think none of these skills come naturally to anyone. People who are bilingual, uh, sure, they can probably speak two languages and have spoken them all their lives, but there's an extra, I think most of my students will probably agree, <laughs> Phoebe being one of them, there's a sort of extra effort, an extra mile you have to go to actually come up with someone else's words in the other language. It's one thing to do it yourself in your own situation where you're choosing what you're saying, but someone else is choosing what they're saying and you're having to find a way to say it. And that is a skill you learn and practice is all. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. The lady down there, and then I had said... Um, hello, I come uh, from a uh, public service interpreting background and I've got a very brief question. Would you comment on a uh, post-gold lottery trap? Well, that's what they call it. I have got skills, qualifications, but I live at a very awkward, far away uh, post-gold, which means that agencies do not send more of my way. How to overcome this obstacle? Thank well, you. public service interpreting, as far as the courts are concerned, are all run by one of the agencies I put in my presentation called Capita Translation. They, Capita Translating and Interpreting, I think is the name. They took over running all the courts in England and Wales two or three years ago, and they book pretty well all the interpreters. So if you want to work in the court system, you have to sign up realistically with them, and they will inevitably, cost-cutting exercise, find the interpreter who's closest to the job. Having said that, I was asked yesterday to go to Bolton. Um, it is possible to travel wide, more widely, not least because things crop up in the last moment and they don't have anyone available at the time. So it's very difficult if you live outside a particular catchment area to know how to get the work. There, I mean, it is a trap. Uh, you can move. That's probably not very feasible and not very helpful. Yeah. Um, or you can hope that you get work and then from that more work flows and you do a good job and they realize you're reliable. It is tricky. It is in all these, all the government departments, all the people booking interpreters are basically tightening their belts and they're all <coughs> looking to cut costs. It's, whatever, it's, it's happening everywhere and I don't think there's any reason why they would take me from central London to go to Edinburgh if they've got four or five people closer there who may not have as many years experience but they're perfectly able and qualified to do the job and will probably do an excellent job as well. Do you know what I mean? It comes down at the end of the day to money uh, and that's the reality we have to face and so if you are in an area which is slightly out of X central um, you will possibly get offered fewer jobs I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. I think we need to move on just very quickly in the middle there. Last question. Hello. Um, so, quick context. A few months ago, I was part of a translation challenge at my university, which involved all of the language students in the, uh, in the university um, getting together in teams and making a translation from English to another language. Um, now, the source text in this case was a description of a local art exhibition slash museum um, written by the curator himself. Art exhibition. Okay. Um, the consensus among all the teams regardless of language was that sort of text was absolute and utter crap, to be honest. Um, it, it was really bad. 
bad. It has some interesting word choices, absolutely cringeworthy phrasing, and it just tried very hard to be sophisticated and it failed. Um, the problem was that it was very hard to translate such a text and everybody had difficulty. Okay. So my question is, how do you, if you receive as a translator <laughs> a text that is just pretty awful in terms of <coughs> syntax and style, how do you go about it? Can you contact the client directly and be honest? Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. I'm sure you um, must have encountered something. In my experience, I correct it and send it back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, professionally, you should point out to your client the shortcomings of the text they've given you. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah and yeah. explain how hard it would be. Yeah. And, and again, if they say, well, this is what we've been given, and you know, you have to, then you find out what the target audience mm. is, and you write a new text to that target audience, essentially, mm. containing yeah. all the information, but one that works. You also tell them that if they want you to rewrite it, it's a different charge. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 You could get more work on the back of it, right? Yeah. I mean, um, ch chances are when they, you know, it's, it's certainly happened to me many times. Um, we have one of our major, major clients, a, a fast moving consumer goods client um, based in Geneva. Um, and a lot of their staff um, you know, are born and raised in Geneva and, and speak, you know, Swiss English, I'm going to call it. Um, so they'll send us copy, which they, they are non-native speakers. They are, you know, French native speakers, German native speakers. Yet they are writing advertising content in English. Obviously, they're, they're not native, so there are differences. There are areas where we look at it and think, well, you can't say that. Mm. In, in every instance, when we've sent it back and told them, well, actually, this should be this, this should be that. These are our recommendations. Here is a track change document. Every time they've accepted it. So I would say, as long as, long as you're polite and you're courteous, you know, by and large, the client will, you know, trust the fact that you are a professional linguist. They'll respect you more for it as long as you, you know, point it out in the right way. And then you'll end up with a source document that you can actually work with. Yeah, yeah. And always be polite. Always. I mean, quite often you'll find that you're working with people who are real experts in their field, even if they can't write in English or whichever language it's in. So you have to be polite and respect them for what they do know give them pointers on what they don't. Right, thank you. I think everyone's probably hungry now. Um, but first of all, before you go, I'd like to thank all our speakers. Thank you very much. And we'll see you back here at 2 o'clock this afternoon.